team report. What's happening? You lost both teams? Get a grip on this operation, Heather. That's boring. Green light the asset. Sir, I need more time. We have no time. Are you going to give that order or not? Sir, please. You are too naive to see the truth. There's no bringing in Bourne. We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation needs to realize that when we tell you to do something, do it. And if you're wrong, you're wrong. If you're right, then the courts will figure it out. We don't get to take the law. We enforce it. But at the end of the day, each and every man is to go home safe. Sometimes the use of force is necessary. You need to comply with the police officer the way the system was meant to be. Comply with the orders of police officers. Resisting arrest is a real and dangerous crime. Nonpartisan liberty for all. I am your host, Dave Bourne, and it is January. Ah, <laughs> my mic uh, stand, scissor, whatever. Uh, well, that needs to be fucking tight in there. Um, <laughs> it's January 11th, 2017, and we are coming to you live uh, from Las Vegas. If it is 6.04 uh, Pacific time, just so you know, now that we're 24-7, that we're actually live right now uh, to try to increase the call-ins and, well, I would <laughs> I would say get some call-ins and get some people interactive in the show. We don't have a lot of live listens. We do get a fair amount of listens. It's just it's always on the uh to the archives and very few live. Um but I enjoy doing the live show, so we will continue to do it live whether you call in or not. But um thank you for tuning in to Nonpartisan Liberty for All. We're on weeknights Tuesday through Thursday, now at six o'clock Pacific nine o'clock eastern uh six uh, or seven o'clock uh arizona time uh, <laughs> on the nonpartisan liberty for all media and radio network which as i mentioned now runs 24 7 and you can listen to the live stream on spreaker.com and nonpartisan liberty for all.com and to the archives immediately following the show on spreaker youtube twitter tumblr soundcloud stitcher and itunes on Nonpartisan Liberty for All, we promote self-ownership and the ideas of true freedom and liberty, meaning being able to do whatever you want as long as you respect the freedom of others and don't directly interfere with their freedom. Exposing government for what it is, a mafia based on extortion that rules without consent by threat of force and of violence. We, of course are happy to hear from you. As I had mentioned, you can call in at 702-470-7664. That is a phone number 702-470-7664. Or you can Skype into the show username, nonpartisan Liberty for all. And you can get all that information. If you forget the phone number or the Skype username at nonpartisan Liberty for all.com, where we not only have all of that information, we also have articles, blogs, on uh, various items as well as uh, a bunch of other things. So definitely check us out at the website, nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. As it is Wednesday, although we missed uh, a Wednesday there as I took some time off and as uh, did Ken for the holidays, but every other Wednesday we have Ken Shorjan, our expert on the economy and geopolitics, as well as history, which is always good when we get into uh, kind of the background on a lot of different things. So, Ken, it's uh, glad to have you back on the first show, uh, or at least your first show uh, with us uh, on the new year, for the new yep, year. Good to be here. Thanks for for the invite. So I think it's... Uh, I think you've been with us now at least uh, in on the show in every year that we've been in existence, I believe. Uh, we started in 2016, and April will be 
Oh, sorry, 2014. What am I saying? April will be three years. And I know you weren't on initially, but I believe you were on sometime in 2014, later in the year. So you've been on for a while. Um, and of like course, a bad, all, like a bad penny. No, I, <laughs> <laughs> you always, I, I always, uh, of course, praise you when you're on because, and, and I'm not just, I don't just say it to say it. I mean, obviously. Uh, you do a great job, and and that's why I had told you always that you should do your own, you know, podcast, which now uh, is up to well, it was up to a thousand. And you said it went back down to nine ninety nine, but I'm sure it will be back at a thousand uh, pretty soon. So you're you're at your first thousand subscribers, and I I've read uh, or listened to other podcasts, you know, people that have like. 500,000 or 100,000 and they talk about when they hit their first thousand and stuff and how that was a big thing and then you know it just it it, it, sky's the limit you know um you haven't been doing it that long and you've already hit your first thousand and you know hopefully it will just keep going up uh from there and you can search on youtube for ken shorjan or the link is in any of the show uh, descriptions. Um, any anywhere you find the archives, you will find the the link um, as it is some weird um, like number or random whatever. Because I know you didn't you never changed the the link or whatever. But um, well, possibly you know the other easiest way is just. Rather than try to spell my last name, just put the Daily Economist. Dana, and right, pull up that's a whole another list way. Of to, videos and right, you know, it's it's actually been the the last thirty days have been a pretty good uh, milestone. Uh, I don't want to pat myself in the back here, but uh, some milestones I was looking for. Um, I got a thousand followers on Twitter. I got a million, finally a million over a million page views now for the Daily Economist website, and then you know, this tonight, a thousand. So those are three milestones that I've been looking for for the past three or four months. That yeah, finally that's, hit. that's great. And, uh, of course on this show, uh, the last two shows, uh, that you've been on, we've gone over a hundred listeners, <laughs> not that that's, uh, I mean, when, if, if you only do not you being you, but if I only did like one show a week, I think that would be a lot higher but because there's not only my show on the network, there's also the Illumination Hour with Ellen Ball, who does a great show as well. But um, the last two shows we've done uh, both have gone over a hundred, uh, which is is pretty good for you know what uh, I'm putting out there. I guess it at least uh, I have low expectations. So, um, but yeah, so it's it's good there as well not as as much as of course the uh youtube channel um but uh people always tune in when you're on the show um so that's good also um and one thing i wanted to talk about real briefly that that we uh had ended up talking about is this monetization speaking of youtube on youtube so they allow you to make barely any money really i mean i think i don't get a lot of views on youtube because most of the listens come from spreaker or uh the website or something like that or some other place um occasionally i will i'll get shows like i did get one show that was like 867 it depends on the topic but um i think i've only made like a dollar or something (laughs) or maybe two dollars and they won't pay you till you make a a hundred so it it's not like they pay you all that much money and 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 it also depends it's it's relative yeah, it depends um, yeah. on how long they people listen to. If they last listen, month, you know. Last month I did not three a week necessarily. Uh, there were four, four and a half weeks. I think I did about uh, let's see, nine, ten, about ten, maybe eleven shows last last month. Um, mostly I got around nine hundred to eleven hundred views per per show. That's pretty good. And uh, I 
I think I was monetized. I got fifty five bucks. And the, yeah, and they won't pay you until it, it hits a hundred. Right? Well, yeah, but since I also get AdSense for my website. Oh, okay. So it combines. I so get they, right, right. But, but the point is, is I think there's some milestones they have in their algorithms. That's why a thousand subscribers is important because I think they that adjust. your money goes up like it's the other yeah the other thing is is it's based on people watching the ad and or clicking on the ad and with so many people today having ad blockers uh, that, that a lot of times they won't even get the ads so right, right. that sort of hurts too yeah and even if if you uh, also have if you have YouTube Red you don't even get uh, ads period you pay not to get ads but yeah there's also other ways to block those so but um, regardless one of the points that um, I wanted to make, I brought this up briefly before, and I understand like you'll get, uh, you won't be able to monetize anything that includes copyrighted content. Okay, I understand that, even though I personally don't believe in copyright laws, but that's a whole other issue. Um, so I, I have some of those mostly from uh, the uh, Ellen show, um, some of the music that she used, but um, I had brought that up in the last couple ones that didn't happen. But I've also gotten a bunch because of the content, but the content, I, I think they really base it off the name or whatever, because I did a show on Prince. And I, you know, the title of the show, and I'm actually trying to find the exact ones that uh, they wouldn't allow me to. Okay, here's one right here. And I got 877 views on this one. This is my biggest YouTube show, which I know compared to some people, you have people out there that are getting fucking 300,000 views. I know I'm not, you know, my my audience is very small. I realize that. Um, and. You know, I'm going to continue to talk about what I'm going to talk about. I don't give a fuck because my my purpose is not to. Well, obviously, it's to reach as many people as possible, but it's to get across what I'm trying to get across um, anyway. And I have other plans of uh, some things that we're hopefully going to do in uh, the next couple weeks. But I've been sick and uh, last weekend didn't get to do them. I want to do some YouTube videos. And hopefully that will help to get more uh, people seeing some of the content because compared to a two hour radio show minimum, you know, people will watch a five to 10 minute video. And those are the people that are getting, you know, the 300,000 views. Not that I'm saying I would get anywhere near that, but it will help to promote the show. But anyway, this all this was was about how the DEA uh, schedule one Kratom. And that was the name of it, you know, DEA to Schedule 1 Plant Kratom. And that's what I talked about. And they wouldn't allow me. It's a, it says not eligible for monetization. And I even appealed it to them because you can do that. And they denied it. And I know they're not listening to the fucking show. Now, they might have a computer uh, or, or something that it runs through with algorithms or whatever. And that somehow determines that but there was really nothing said i mean i'm stating facts about how the dea is going to schedule one a plant and you know they say well this you can't monetize this um a similar thing happened uh i have uh this one was really weird and it might be because it has guns in the title but it was the, the, the title was Don't Worry Status. They haven't forgotten about guns. And I just talked about how, you know, the government's still going to go after guns. And they are. And they same thing. So it, it's kind of ridiculous um, how they, you know, I could understand if I did a show where I'm talking about uh, porn and, you know, graphic stuff or something like that uh, although i i disagree with that but uh, um the fact that they would um you know not monetize anything although they're a private company they can do whatever they want to do i'm not saying i i think that they don't have the right to do it they definitely have the right to do it but 
their how they go about it and the ones that they're doing it to um it's very weird i don't know ken if you gotta have any thoughts on that no i've had one that uh i what i did was i grabbed a video from somebody had uploaded from the 1980s talking about uh you know the an interview that was done with uh people in the mall and i played it in the background using my obs software and i guess since i showed the whole thing uh they came back and said oh you got a copyright issue yeah. right yeah yeah so yeah you got to only use parts and yeah and you 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 got that's when, something i didn't know at the time but you know so be it right right but one, but that but that has nothing to do with your content that's just the, the cop, copyright issue like i said i i've had some of those as well like with the music too i make sure you know i only use um i avoid mostly anything i used to just play songs before i uploaded to youtube now i have clips of just the instrumental part say the beginning and i'll only play like 15 seconds or something um a lot of the clips i play uh as you know during the breaks you know i'll play clips those uh aren't copyrighted unless they're using music usually usually i those are fine it's um okay so the the other one i just wanted to say the name of this too it it was about the prince's death and it says prince opioids and the the government's uh using this to as another reason to go after painkillers so i i mean these are things that are just subjects to talk about i mean i'm talking about the government is going after painkillers i mean it's it's a fact um i don't know how that is something that they can't advertise on or i think it it shows that there's an agenda there because if you look at the ones that were banned anything to do with drugs even though it's not i'm not saying go do drugs the fucking show wasn't hey go do some opiates and some heroin and you know od like prince I mean, I was just telling what happened with Prince and how they're going to exploit this. And the other, another one was about guns, how the government's going after guns. And it's only if it's in the title, because like I said, they're not listening to the show. I've done a lot of shows where I've talked about the government going after guns. But the fact that I had gun in the title, I, I'm almost positive that's why they did that. And and that's it, it reminds me of fucking like radio. Like, I don't know if you know this because um, you probably don't listen to a lot of rap music, but they've always been doing this. Any word for a gun that is said in uh, at least in on rap stations uh, on regular radio or bullshit radio, whatever, um, corporate Terrest- radio, terrestrial. terrestrial. Uh, yeah. <laughs> Uh, they will bleep out and they've been doing that for you know 30 years i mean since uh back you know in early 90s late 80s um they've been doing that so i don't know it's just fucked up so just wanted to mention that there that youtube seems to have an agenda and and one more, you know, quick thing. We have to think about all of these, um, I guess, websites that we use in social media that they are private companies. They do have a right to do what they want to do. But if we're only use, we're using ones that or we're limiting ourselves with ones that are pretty much owned all by the same companies. There's a couple of companies. I mean, Facebook uh, owns some things and then YouTube is Google. And then you have uh, Twitter, which I, I'm not sure if uh, Google has bought them up, but I mean, they're, they're all linked and there's, there's basically there's a minimal amount of companies and we're kind of giving them all the power to censor us if they want now it's not censorship in the sense of you know the government is stopping it it's a private company which again they have the right to do but it's giving a lot of power if we limit ourselves to 
uh, s- just a few select companies that are producing the so the social this social media. So hopefully, there'll be. M- I mean, usually what happens is that they buy it up if it becomes too popular. One of the big corporations is going to buy it up, unfortunately. But I think we need more independent uh, forms of social media where we can display uh, this stuff where they're going to be more open in their policies to not uh, restrict a lot of these things. Now, they didn't ban any of it as far as not put it on the site or not play it you know people can play it and they can see it whatever it's just you can't monetize it it's not a big deal but will that lead to something you know in the future and and who knows so just wanted to uh mention that since me and ken have been talking about youtube um and his channel one other thing i wanted to mention and i, I don't know ken if you i assume you would but i don't know uh did you happen to watch the national championship game? A little bit. I was shooting pool league that night and uh, got to watch, you know, pretty much all the scoring in the fourth quarter. Yeah, this is something that um, just real quick I wanted to bring up. Uh, we can't can't ignore the the uh, college football national championship. Uh, and finally, Alabama fucking loses on a last-second play, those who saw the game. Uh, it was a great game. And, you know, I just – I love the purity. Well, there's a – it's not totally pure, but compared to the NFL, at least, of college uh, sports. And, you know, it's, it's, it's getting worse as well, but it, the NFL is – just fucking makes me sick sometimes um with their promotion of uh bullshit but anyway uh clemson tigers national champions it was a rematch of the same uh last year's game and this year clemson can't comes out on top last year alabama did so uh i don't know what the spread was did you, you happen to know what the spread was on that game uh no I no, I think Alabama was favored, so if you had Clemson, uh, then you you won. I would assume. Yeah, no. The thing that stuck out the most for me was in this uh, dynasty run for Alabama, they've done so with absolutely no name quarterbacks. Yeah, I mean the guy they had now, uh, hurts. <laughs> it's kind of fucked up last name. You don't want your quarterback's last name to be hurts. Um, literally it's spelled H U R T S. It's not like yep. Hertz, like the car rental it's Hertz. Like <laughs> fucking it hurts. Um, yeah, I mean they haven't, well, they, their offense is, is terrible. I mean, they have a running game, but they had a terrible offense, but you're right. Um, last year too, um, not since there was one, um, going back a couple years, he's in the NFL, but he's like a third string quarterback. That was uh, pretty good. But, yeah, I think uh, it's Jake, Jake Coker, I think was. And then you had uh, uh, the guy who, from last year, the he came, he got picked in the seventh round. or, or Maybe that's who I'm thinking of, the guy from last by, year. Uh, by Arizona, but didn't make it out of uh, spring, you know. Yeah. Summer camp. No, it's uh, not. It's not him. There's uh, maybe it's the guy before that that actually is in the NFL as a third string um, quarterback. There, there's one. Oh yeah, he's he, he's the backup to. I think he's the backup to Ben Roethlisberger. But yeah, y- y- you're right. They, they well, they do it with defense, a defense and a running game. You look at their running backs. I mean, they're always uh, going to the NFL. Their first or second round. Oh picks. yeah, Mark Ingram. Yep, uh, Derrick Henry. Was, Derrick was Henry. Derrick Henry, yeah, from last year. Um, so they, their running backs are always being picked in the first or second round, and their defense, uh, their, I don't know how many picks that they have on defense, but they're able to, of course, replenish that every year uh, with Nick Saban and, of course, people wanting to go to a winning program. You know, I'm hoping that uh, – I just want to mention this real quick – from what I read, as long as the NFL 
owners approve it, the Raiders will be coming to Las Vegas, which is funny because that's been my team since I was a kid because I always wanted to move to L.A. to make movies. Then I learned about uh, how California is like a socialist fucking state, and I wanted to be as close to California as possible but didn't want to live there. But um, I followed the uh, Raiders since, shit, I was like 12 or 13. So to have them in my uh, city, and and really this is my adopted home. Um, I've been here 16 years now. It, it was uh, 16 years like a week ago. So um, to have the Raiders here would be great, even though I wouldn't go to the games because I won't go to places where they search you at the door. But what it will do is give UNLV great facilities and will help their recruiting and I think we'll do a lot for for them. So that's the the positive. Um, and as it is, the only games I watch are, are, are speaking of the Raiders. They uh, they were down to their third string quarterback. Uh, so the NFL playoffs uh, started this past weekend, and uh, they didn't really have a chance. I mean, Derek Carr is their starter, who's could have been an MVP candidate, but went down with a broken leg in what the second to last game. And it was kind of over for them. And they made it to the playoffs the first time since they went to the Super Bowl in 2002. So I uh, will probably find out in a couple of weeks whether the Raiders are coming here or not. And they said uh, they'll probably play two more years in Oakland. And that, that to me will be great. And I think what the reservations always were besides the gambling, which doesn't make a difference because you can drive up from Arizona. I mean, you've been here. I mean, what the fuck? Uh, what, what is the, it, we have teams that are in San Diego, in LA, in Phoenix that could come to Vegas. And if you're a football player, why would you bet on a game legally anyway? So everybody can fucking see you. I guess you could have people do it for you, but it, the, the gambling part is to me irrelevant but it's the everybody that moves to vegas moved from someplace else and they have their own team and that's what they're worried about well, well the, no the problem the problem is is that those are antiquated uh preconceived conceptions yeah because you know how it's vegas was started vegas was started by the mob right and it was and it was run by the mob until the early 80s when corporations took over right. so the nfl was was of course running for you know decades before and that stigma like i said at a certain point the preconceived opinions no longer counted but that stigma it's the same thing right now it stayed um, there because they, know, the commissioner they, they call, even mentioned uh gambling but sorry to interrupt but they mentioned gambling before uh I th it might have been the prior commissioner uh yeah, have well, mentioned Ta Tagliabo, Tagliabo and roselle were old school i mean roselle yeah. was there at the afl NFL merger and Tagliabu was his chief henchman. So yeah, the guy who ignored the the, the uh, evidence on concussions. Um, I don't know if you saw the the movie with Will Smith that was based yeah. on a true story. Um, who basically ignored that and wanted to keep it quiet. And you got to you got to remember this too. Okay, here's the thing: uh, the commissioners all are there at the behest of the owners, not the players. They represent the owners. Right. And if you think about it, Roselle and Tagliabu, and of course, uh, you know the current one, Goodell. Guess what their prior profession was? Lawyers. You know. Right. So. So I mean, right there, you know. Yeah, but they're, they're good. They're good in getting out of uh, uh, out of legal ramifications. But the the other part of it was that I've heard that before. That well, Vegas is you know a town that a lot of people move here from another place. But, I mean, that's a benefit in, in a sense because you also have, if your team's in town, you know, go see, see your team play while you're in Vegas. You know what I mean? So you oh, yeah. have that well, as well. Uh, but um, see, that was, that was the biggest fear because in reality, Vegas does not have a massive uh, native population. No, it doesn't. But it does okay, have a big population as far as the it, the Las Vegas metropolitan area. We'll say, you know, Clark County is it, is it a 
at about two point five million. So I mean, we have plus if you factor in all of the people that come here, and like I said, if they come here and maybe catch a game while they're here because their team's playing. Plus, you have, you know, all the fans in L.A. that are still fans of the Raiders from when they were in L.A. You have the fans in Oakland that it's not a, that long of a trip. Um, so it would be a good fit to have a team like the Raiders that are that yes, close yes as no. well. Yes and no. Out, you know, out of all the teams, there there's two that I would never trust with a 10-foot pole to come to my town. You know what teams well, those are? Well, I know are? the Raiders are, are nuts. I know you're going to say the Raiders. And the Rams. Well, the Rams. They have much of a history. I, I don't know what. They went from St. Louis to L.A. back to St. Louis. Oh, because of they they move all LA. over the place. Yeah. Yeah. And the, the Raiders. Well, they, well the Raiders. Los Angeles, they couldn't get the sellout. Yeah, but, but that was and when Al so Davis the, was they, there. Well, Al Davis is the, dead. Does the Davis family still own the bloody thing? Yeah, but I don't know that uh, so far, and I know it's only been a couple years since Al Davis died, but so far, Mark Davis, who is the son that seems to be, you know, running things. I think there's two sons that are are mainly involved, Um, but he seems to be taking a different approach because Al Davis was a hands on. I agree with you. Mark Mark Davis is is a much better owner, but here's here's the, the, the thing. OK, it's like Pittsburgh. Pittsburgh isn't particularly that big when it comes to, to football towns or or say the no, Nebraska it's not a big town. Huskers. But that's the all Green, they got. It's so the Green they, Bay Packers. Right. Um, no. Yeah. Know, Green Bay is a small. I mean, Vegas is bigger than a lot of markets right. that have teams. Jacksonville. When, when the Raiders went to L.A. OK. Uh, and that LA was what fans, year was that? Was that that was in the eight like 1980 or something or 81? Yeah. Mean, no, 19, 1980, the L.A. Rams played the Pittsburgh Steelers in the Super Bowl, so it was a little bit later than that. The, no, the key thing was is that – Well, in 84, I know they were L- – when they played in the Super Bowl, they were the L.A. Raiders. So it, it was right – it was before 84. It was per, then between 80 and 84. But whatever, right. it's it's irrelevant. Yeah, the point the point is is that Oakland fans are a unique – Yeah, they're nuts. Bunch of fans. They're and fucking Oakland nuts. fans, you know – Think about this: all those, all those uh, painted up, uh, you know, swashbucklers that you see going nuts in the stands. I, I read an expose on that one time. Many of them are business professionals and executives. Yeah, but they're, I, they're, they're like they're like uh, when, I, I, you know, the the motorcycle, uh, the annual motorcycle trip to South yeah. Dakota. Yeah, that's when a bunch of uh, you know millionaires and dentists and the whole nine yards put on the on the chaps and the leather and they get on a bike and they go to uh go to south dakota and yeah but knows, you know they're not they're not your typical right right you but, know hell's angels but from what i understand oakland as a city is like the shitty half of fucking san francisco you know it's well, it like the shitty half of the bay so when they move and and you got to understand too when they moved to LA they played in the Coliseum which from what I know from people from LA that that is a bad area and, and I think you, uh, SC plays there now yeah SC. but that's a fucking bad area you go a couple blocks outside of USC and it's it's the you know yeah it's it's, it's almost like it's, so, it's south it it is it's South Central uh, Los Angeles uh, that's what they call that's what like uh, rappers would call USC the University of South Central not not because of the school just because it fit the letters but. Yeah, I, I think with the new ownership, I know it's his sons, but, you know, in building a stadium and, and you know, I think that Vegas has been here a long time now, and there's a lot of people that have built roots in Las Vegas. And, you know, you and I, I've sc- seen it. You know, like I said, I've been here 16 years now. So You know what the other scary part about, uh, you know, putting a team in Vegas? And this is something that's – you know, sort of on the side, but in reality, if you know, as we know from most sports athletes who are ultra competitive, um, how many of them who are who come from you know poor families, or whatever, you suddenly put them in a place where there's gambling, 
Oh, that they're going to go, like, They play are going to go yeah. bankrupt. They're going to get into trouble. Well, they do that. I, I see what you're saying. They're going to go hang but, on the strip but, or but something. It takes, or... it takes much. No, no, no. But I'm just saying it takes much more to go take a vacation to Vegas and then go home. True. But if but... you have to live there nine months of your, of your thing, of, of your season or whatever, you get a bunch of people who, you know, want to go out and party all the time and they just get – Think about you know it's like the Allen Iversons. Allen Iverson made something like 180 yeah, million. Yeah, I know and he went bankrupt. Got, there was a documentary yeah. on him that I I watched, but um, and it, he came from the ghetto. He didn't even um, he was living with a fr- uh, another family. Where do most NFL um, football players come from? But it, right, but that you could say that about New York City. Um, yeah, and look at LA. How many you know, to- there is the di- and and you know what they got the Indian casinos in a lot of places too. Don't don't forget about that. No, you're right, you're right about that. But I, I'm looking at it from from an objective point of view. I, no, I under I totally understand what you're saying. If I and lived, it, it, it's if, a if point I taken. Vegas, if I lived in Vegas, I would be in trouble. Well, you have a you have a problems. <laughs> yeah, but, but you know how many how many people who. I'm not super competitive like I used to be. You know, I don't want to go sit down at a poker table and and go heads up just to get, but you get athletes who are in their early 20s to 30 who are super competitive and you know, think about it. They they play they play cards on the plane back for tens of thousands of dollars. But I mean, they you might, you they're going to get remember, into people like that. Guy, do you remember the guy with the Knicks? Uh, Gilbert Arenas. I know of Gilbert gun. Arenas, but oh yeah, 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 yeah. yeah when he pulled yeah. the gun on that other player, you know why? Because the guy owed him money from card games on the plane. <laughs> well, basketball is, I would say, the players are worse than football. Uh, although yeah. there's more football players because uh, your team's bigger. But I, I mean, that's not a reason not to bring a team to Vegas. It, it's a, it's a good point that you are going to get guys partying. But if you're in a city like New York, I mean, just because it's not legal, I mean, you could have guys under, they have tons of underground poker games. They have bookies. They have, they could get themselves, at least they're not going to get themselves in illegal trouble. If you think about it. My point point is, is there's, there's a difference between you can go to your, to your gas station and play, you know, get slot machines in your face. And another thing to have to go to these underground places, you're not going to, you know, it, it takes a little bit of work versus. Yeah, but not much. And, and, they're, and they're throwing dice right in front of you. you yeah, know, but that, I'm that, saying that, the, the difference is, though, is that for them going and playing a poker game, they're not going to get in any trouble. They they don't, you know, if they go and gamble in Vegas. Yes and no. They're because, not going to get. Because they have not a legally. Paycheck, right. But, but because they have a promised paycheck. They're gonna want to go to the high rollers, and they're gonna get the you know the casinos. Some guys are will do that, and, right? I'm not saying everybody. I'm well, look at boxers. Stuff. I mean, boxers. That, a lot of boxers live here, and they because they fight here. Like Floyd Mayweather lives here, well, and he Mayweather he does do that. And he's an independent contractor. You know, when you're with a team, right? You know, that's the the thing. You know, yeah. they don't have cur- Use for for no reason when they're on the road, right? You're gonna have those people like uh, what's his name who came from a uh, fucking was it A and M? Uh, what's what's that Quarter- guy? Quarterback. He he went to the Browns and I think yeah. he might be out of out of football right now. Uh, what did they call him? Yeah, I, I know. I know. He had a nickname. Quarter- um, oh, Johnny. Uh, Johnny football. Uh, yeah, Johnny football. Johnny. Well, I'm thinking. Yeah, he, he it started with an M. Off. I'm thinking Johnny Johnny Mathis, but <laughs> it's not John, Mandel. Johnny Mandel. Yeah. yeah, is he isn't he out of football now? Yeah, because he yeah. wanted to party. So I mean, I, it, it's a it's a good point, but I mean, what's going to happen is going to happen. But that's not a reason not to have a team. Here. No, 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 no. I'm I'm saying I know I know what, I know what you're saying. You have to look at you're all just right, the right logistics because. You know, it's not like you're playing there one game. Well, I like, mean, you like have they go to London or right. go to Mexico City. But this is a permanent move, and it's going to affect. Right, I understand. You, when you go to the draft, you're going to have to you're going to have to do psychological makeups that are far beyond what you might. But do. you also have a, a college football team here who doesn't have a lot of money, 
who could easily be bought to throw games and shit like that. And so, you know, we've had a college team in, in the, the, even though they haven't been too good, but in um, the FBS, or I don't know that they call it the FBS anymore because they have playoffs because it stood for football bowl something. Um, but, I mean, we have UNLV here, and we've had the you know championship team in basketball uh, back in the 90s. So, I mean, it's definitely something that the coaches will have to address, you know, but it's – it's not something to uh, stop the team from coming here. But basically from what I've heard is that most of the owners are on board and that it should happen. Now, I don't know. That's speculators that are saying that, and I'm just reading the articles. So I don't know when the meeting is, but they said it was the January meeting of the owners. They were voting on it then. So it, they only need like a certain amount of owners. And I guess – they had said Jerry Jones was on board, and that was a big thing because he's a very in- influential owner. So, I don't I don't want to take up any more time on this. Uh, sorry to uh, get us off track there, but that's uh, I was looking at that today and thinking about. Uh, well, I was looking at UNLV actually, and I had looked up the most recent article about the Raiders coming here, and and I just think that would be cool for us to finally have a, a football team. I, I believe a hockey team's coming here, but I don't give a fuck about hockey. Oh, yeah. And, you know, I, I love the fact that, you know, the football stadium for me, the Arizona Cardinals, they are about, uh, let's see, five miles north and about seven miles west. So, you know, 12, 12 miles away is the stadium. And uh, the thing about it is, is I went to one game and the, the prices, everything, the prices are outrageous. Yeah, I wouldn't go. I'm not going to go to the NFL games um, because I don't want to give the NFL money anyway. But I'm I'm excited because the UNLV will play in the same stadium. So I saw that. I saw uh, UNLV has a shitty stadium. stadium. It it's it's gonna happen. Um, Are they playing in that new stadium? No, no. They you're talking about Team Team Mobile Arena. Or is arena. that a basketball arena? No, it, uh, it hasn't yeah, been okay. built yet. That, I mean, that's an arena for everything. They they, gotcha. they still play at Thomas and Mac. Well, I heard I heard that a hockey team's going to come. Maybe the hockey team's going to play at T-Mobile Arena. It may actually be the Arizona Cardinal or I mean the Arizona Coyotes. Phoenix it, Coyotes. Th- that might be where they're going to play at T-Mobile Arena because that's the new arena that you're talking about. But no, they're going to build a whole new football stadium because right now they play at Sam Boyd Stadium, which is way the fuck on the like east side, and it takes it's. <laughs> It, it, yeah, the, the, the Raiders. It, the Raiders sucks. The Raiders had the opportunity to go to to L.A. where they're going to build a brand new stadium. Uh, the thing about it is, is with with uh, going to a college team. You know, the the Phoenix Cardinals when they first came here, they played at ASU. And yeah, they played I know. At ASU for about a decade before they finally caught con- at Sun Devil and, Stadium, and that was horrible because for you know two months they had to play all night games. Because the, There's the temperature no dome. was in the hundreds. Yeah, exactly. And they're going to build a dome stadium here, and that's what we need. Same thing with UNLV. I mean, it's, uh, you know, I, I had season tickets for a couple years, and um, I'll probably get them again this year. But, uh, yeah, it, it sucks. It's it's even at night, you know, when they're playing in September or the first game is in August, and it's, you know, 8 o'clock, you're fucking – still sweating to death out there so i imagine what the players are fucking going through i mean i'm in the stands in shorts and a jersey and you know sweating to death so so a lot of stories going on um one of the things that i wanted to talk about that you had brought up on your show is this increase in social security taxes and i know you mentioned specifically fica tax is that the before you get into this Is it the – I know currently that there's a cap on how much they take, that they will only take up to so much. Well, that's that's exactly what it is, is, uh, you know, no matter how much somebody makes up until this year. Yeah, there's – they cap it because – I know because of uh, my job and – well, not my job now, but the same company I work for, what I used to do, 
I knew that at a certain point uh, they would have to watch that because the uh, let's just say people were making there's some sales that go on legal sales. <laughs> it's not it's it's a corporation that I work for. I just don't want to say where, but um, they would have to watch because they make a ridiculous amount of money. These type of sales. I think I told you the the industry, but. Um, they make a ridiculous amount of money, some of these people. So they had to watch because at some point they had to stop taking the Social Security tax because they maxed out, basically. True. But if you got an HR department, the uh, the software, the accounting software that HR uses, they should have that automatically. Yeah, but they, it, because of bonuses and shit like that, it, it, was, it, it was a little more complicated. But yeah. Uh, Gotcha. Yeah. The, uh, the interesting thing is, is up until this year, uh, it had, it had stayed at 118,500. Your first 118,500 earned was taxed with a FICA tax. And also, uh, you gotta remember if you work for a company and you get a W2, half of it is your tax out of yours and half of it is the company. So moving it to 127,200, that's going to be approximately $500 more tax that uh, an individual have to pay and five hundred dollars more for the company so wait are you saying that it's everybody's gonna have to pay more or that no, they're no, no, taking no, 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 the no, no, no. they're just taking the cap off is what you're saying no 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 if if you made less if you made one hundred eighteen thousand dollars in less you're not gonna oh, be okay. affected at all period. okay so it's only if you made so, so say right, right. Makes 150,000 because that's the cap is what you're saying before right. So now, here's the interesting thing about it is, by law, some obscure law, you they cannot raise the maximum cap like that unless that year they paid a COLA to Social Security recipients. What does that mean? Uh, cost of living allowance. You know, like uh, supposedly Social Security, the each year they have to give a cost of living allowance based on the rate of inflation. So oh, right, years, right. they've been the, doing three, four percent, and that's one of the reasons also why well, the uh, that CPI, the government, the, and that's the, why the government fudges the numbers so they don't have to pay cola to all of these uh, benefit recipients. Right. So, what they're doing then? It, are, are they taking the cap off or no, just, mo- just moving it, it up? Yeah, from one eighteen thousand five hundred to one twenty seven thousand two hundred, and then anything after one twenty seven thousand two hundred doesn't have a FICA tax attached to it. So they're moving it. They're moving the goalposts. They're moving it. Oh, nine. Trying to trying to go after the rich. You know, stick it to the rich. Right. Well, here's here's the interesting thing. Most people don't know about Social Security. They think Social Security. You know, it originally was sold. As an insurance policy, it's, it's an it's, insurance it's policy. It's a fucking fraud, but go yeah, ahead. It's, it's, it's a Ponzi scheme. Yeah, all right, right. But it was originally an insurance uh, thing, where similar to private insurance, you put money in. They take the, the the they combine the money. They invest it in safe things like municipal bonds, corporate bonds, annuities, these type of things. Build it up, and then of course you get paid at the end of the thing. Well, here's the interesting thing: in the in the 1960s, as a matter of fact, 1960, in a case of Fleming versus Nestor, the Supreme Court ruled that workers have no legally binding contractual rights to their Social Security benefits, and that those benefits can be cut or even eliminated at any time. That's nice. It's also, I mean. The other thing, and I was just talking about this a couple of days ago, the other thing that Social Security did that has nothing to do with money or taxes or anything is it created a numeric fucking ID that actually used to say on the card not to be used as identification, um, which went out the window. Now, my theory is that they did that um, on purpose with this numeric id because if you know anything about databases and linking data you can't you're not going to link text because if you link text fields you know 
it might have a middle initial or a capital letter or whatever. True, but in 1935, From, they didn't have computers. Right, I understand that. And that's what I was having this conversation with my fiance, and she had brought that up. And she said, well, they didn't have computers back then. And I said, well, they didn't have, like, personal computers but from what i understand the government had didn't they have some sort of i don't know if you'd even call it a computer but they were starting with stuff like that because okay. I, 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 I hold on and, and and then respond to this because what i'm thinking is that and never even mind computers data in general so if data is even kept manually it's an easy way to match up the data. So it doesn't even have to be computers. So my theory, and you can say you disagree, and that's fine, but is that either foresight, thinking of the future, or even thinking of that time that we can convert everybody into a unique fucking ID that we'll be able to at some point we can match data from different places and um you know and i whether you're thinking of computers or not either thinking of okay the future we're gonna have computers and all this and that and i'm sure they had you know something computer like at the time who knows what the government had that we don't know about but what are, what are your thoughts on on the, uh, the whole social security number and I, all of that shit. I'll, I'll I'll give you an A for effort, but no, <laughs> it's a little bit more well, nefarious than that. That's okay. It's a little bit more nefarious than that. Do you have your social security card? Uh, not right in front of me. Okay. Have you ever looked at the back? If you have one from like the nineteen eighties and below, remember. there is a red number that has a. It starts with a B and it's a red number. Uh, is this about the like? Well, no, that's birth certificates, but uh, well, yeah, the it's same tied, it's tied thing, to that. Yeah, yeah, the whole thing tied to the birth certificates where what, what ended up it's a bond that uh, it's a bond. It's a, exactly it's a bond number. The reason that they did the social security number is because in nineteen thirty six, most people don't realize the U.S. government went bankrupt. And this is in the congressional record. This is not conspiracy theory. Right. It's in the congressional record. And what they did then is they had to, to pay off their creditors. They uh, created or they sold uh, to get money. Guess where they got the money from for, for their solvency? Is this they taking the gold, collecting the gold from people? This was after collecting the gold. This was this was after that. But but it does involve gold. They went and borrowed gold from the Vatican. Oh yeah, yeah. We had talked about this, this before. Yeah, this is why if you go to Dun yeah, and Brad, that Va the Vatican is like th there's some incorporation with them the or something. The CEO of the United right. States of America Corporation is, is, is the a, Pope or something. No, it's a Vatican yeah. bishop out of like Boston. Right, right. We, yeah, because we had talked about this on a, on another show. Right, and now here's the point. The Social Security card was created under the guise that it was for Social Security, but really what it is, and this is the reason why it's issued to somebody at birth versus, say, when you start working and well, start paying that, Social that's, Security taxes. Uh, that's not necessarily true because true. – you don't have to get it that that that's up to the parents now right when but, I, like but they, they try this. to put but this is what they 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 do now because i'm looking into this um first of all i didn't get mine until i was like 10 or 11 but what right. they did and i'm sure you know this is you used to be able and we might have even talked about this you used to be able to claim your kids without a social security number on your taxes now you can't do that anymore if you want to claim your kids on your taxes, you have to get them a social security card. Now, hospitals will try to get you a social security card right there at birth, but you don't have to get one, but then you can't claim your kids on your taxes. So they, they pass that law because they want everybody to have a social security card, but you don't actually uh, have to get one at birth. Especially if you, uh, what, e well, even if you have a kid at a hospital, from what I understand, you have a choice as to get one or not. 
but a lot of people are going to do it because they want to be able to claim their kids on, on their taxes. Right. And the other, so for me, I would not get a social security card until the kid is old enough where they make a choice that they want to get one because you can get a tax ID uh, to work instead of a fucking social security card. Now, I don't know if they would de- deny you and say, no, we weren't, we won't give you a tax ID where you have to get a social security card. But at the current time, it's not mandated that you have a social security card at, at birth. However, they kind of, they passed that law on purpose to make more people get their kids social security cards at birth. There's no reason why a fucking baby needs a social security card. Now, there is because of this. But at the same time, even though I, um, we've talked about this before, and I totally understand that and uh, agree with you on th- that the, the so- social security has nothing to do with really you know, helping people when they get older and giving them money. It's the whole Ponzi scheme thing and that they're doing it as this, but, but, but hold on. That doesn't mean that this unique ID wasn't in their minds at the same time is what I'm saying. It doesn't mean that my theory is totally off. It could be part of the whole. Right. But here's the problem. Here's why they did social security cards at the time they do it. You know why? Because Multiple people have exactly the same names. And if they're going to have a, ex- ex- a, a, a filing database. Right. This is what I, this, that's exactly what I said. Right. But it wasn't for the purpose necessarily for, I mean, obviously. It's to they, identify. They yeah. because right, to, be, ident- to identify people who were part of that right, system. And, and you need a unique, because if you know anything about data, I'm, I'm not saying you, but to the audience or anybody else, that you have, um, I mean, this is computers, but it, you could say the same thing about paper. I mean, it, it's you need a unique ID because of what you said. I mean, you can have people with the same names. And, and then when you go over to computers, it gets even more complicated because text fields have to be exact if you're matching data. Now, I understand you're not talking about matching data from one place to another but yeah it's the same concept really it's they wanted a unique id right what, wh- whether so it's to tie data together or not they want a unique id because of the purposes that you were saying and i believe that you know there was still foresight that you know we can use these in other ways to track people and whatever in the future but Actually, yeah i mean that's you know, what you they're know what doing the initial, you know what the you know real initial reason for creation of social security was it was actually fear of revolution because during the great depression when so many people fear were, of, to get the the getting money to people when they retire or no no the, no fear of revolution no, let me no, but, explain no, this but but I let mean, me explain oh, it go you, ahead, go you're, ahead. you're off on a uh, completely wrong track during the great depression unemployment rates were well over 24 percent and most people had lost all their savings. They lost their farm. They lost all their thing. They right. had no retirement. So what happens for older people who have no chance to retire? They stay in the workforce. And the, the older people are far less likely to, you know, run around and cause trouble if they're, they're jobless. So they needed to find a way to get the older people out of the workforce so that the younger people would be able to focus on work when they created the WPA and the CCC. So they created Social Security to take people who were started out like 55 and older because they didn't expect them to live past 70 at the most, get them out of the workforce so you could put all of these young people who were, you know, People don't realize that, uh, you know, if you've ever read Steinbeck, the yeah, threat, I, well, I the read threat of, of a Mice and Men. Res- yeah, well, in Dubious Battle, I when it was talking about the, the communist, uh, the, the unions were looking, co- we almost became a communist state in the 1930s. The, there was there was well, a know, lot of I, communist influence. Yeah, I, I know there was a big movement in the 30s. There were a right. lot of. So uh, they needed to get them working to so they wouldn't you know have all this spare time to do revolution. And so they had to get the older people out of the workforce. So they decided to pay them off with this thing, 
and they they started the Ponzi scheme. Well, over time, the the Ponzi scheme, of course, you know, the the government sits here and goes, "We got we got two three trillion dollars in this fund that you know we can we can make promises like let's add dis disabled people to the Social Security, yeah, let's add widows and children, and and so they made the promises to get votes to get reelected and get all these people on the on the the dole, and then Bill Clinton decided, you know what? Um, I don't want to look bad. I want to. I made a promise. I'm going to balance budget. I don't want to borrow money from the you know sell treasuries to to the Fed, monetize and yeah, increase he national raided, debt. He, he I'm going to raise money. this. I'm going to put yeah. all the treasuries in the Social Security thing. So there's nothing in the Social Security right. um, trust fund. And all you have to do is go back two or three years when when the uh, Congress um, was going to do a government shutdown. They weren't going to approve a budget. And Jack Lew, the Treasury Secretary, went on on public and said, "Hey, if uh, if they don't do this, we can't pay our obligations, including to Social Security." Well, guess what? Just because they didn't have a budget, the government was still taking in. Well, all it, the it did shut. It did shut down for like what two weeks or something. Not not in 2013. It did in like oh, 2011 right. and 2012. Right, right, right. But in 2013, that came up again in the promise. Oh, okay. And, I, I, see, they, I, I was, know what you're talking about. Right. Not, that was when they decided to remove the debt ceiling all completely. And now, yeah. you know, we're 20. But the point is, is that even though they weren't, uh, the government was going to be shut down, guess what? People were still paying their FICA taxes. So why wasn't there enough money to pay Social Security recipients? Because there's nothing in there. Because <laughs> there's nothing in there. And now more, there's not enough people working to equal the the baby boomers who are all retiring. Right. Now, well, what what happened? Um, just because I, I I don't know this. So, when Social Security started, if you were already over, because at that time it was sixty two, right? I'm looking at your article. That's why. So it right. started at sixty two. So if you were already sixty two or older, did you start to collect Social Security even though you never paid into it? No. If you you had you had to pay back then they didn't have the forty quarters thing, that came a little bit later. But I don't uh, know what that had, is. For, uh, forty quarters for somebody to receive Social Security today, when they retire, they have to have they have to have worked and paid in to their Social Security account for forty working quarters. Forty quarters is oh, ten okay. years. Right. Ten years of paying FICA taxes, and then you get your get your Social Security when you retire. Okay. So that being said, um, the initial person who got on the Social Security list, she was not quite retired. She worked like maybe four, three or four months and paid into it. She paid like I think a total of twenty-four dollars into it. But then she then started collecting because she retired three months after it all started. Guess what? So there she, was. So, she lived to age one hundred. So hey, that's nice. So so just 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 to clarify, so you're saying back then there was no. All you had to do, they they passed Social Security, and as long as you were working and you worked a month or whatever, like you said, she worked twenty four days, you could retire and then collect. Yeah, it, you could have worked a month, paid into it one month, retired, and then got paid. If you didn't, if you didn't put it into the system, then you weren't you weren't going to do it. But all there you was, had to do was put into the system, like, you know, whatever, like a, I, a month or a couple of weeks. So yeah, I'm sure a lot of people. I mean, I don't know if they thought to do that back then, but um, maybe they did. Well, yeah, but but you hit, but most of the people who were younger. See, you got to remember the the longevity at in 1945 was only about. 65 66 years old so if they're retiring at 62 right they're they're only figuring on paying like four years. years yeah they, well life expectancy was only three or four years so they right figured they move off. and see the government bureaucrats they never look at the consequences of of what they they do well of course not and who would have expected that you know people would be living into their 80s and who would have expected that the baby boomers Oh, they loved when the baby boomers paid into the Social Security because that was like massive, you know, l largesse. That was that we had revenue stacking up and we created this three trillion dollar fund. Well, the problem is now the baby boomers are and the Gen Xers and the millennials don't have jobs. The Gen Xers are a small little group and there's not enough. I think the it's right now two workers paying for one recipient. 
Yeah, it's like, well, it's it's basically my generation. I'm on the very end of Generation X, I guess. I don't like to say my, well, I didn't say my age, but I'm, I'm on the kind of outskirts of, of that at the end. And uh, so it's really my generation that, and there's not enough, as like you're saying, there's, it doesn't equal what, the amount of baby boomers that uh are living longer and a lot more of them are uh alive so like my mother is a you know was in that generation and she's 62 so she's going to be retiring soon right so um really what they're doing is they're upping it was it only nine thousand dollars or did, did i 118 to 127 yeah about just short yeah. of nine thousand dollars but still it, it might be uh every year they might up it they might start upping it and was that an irs thing that they just did on their because they can pretty much i think congress probably passed whatever. it up to yeah Congress had put in, Obama had put in, Social Security had put in, they can raise it. No, any any tax raise has to go through Congress. So Congress put in a law that I think they can raise it if only if that year they put in a COLA. But is it so isn't there certain tax code though that the IRS can fucking write on their own? Because they've done that with a lot of agencies. They, they, and this is unconstitutional. This is I actually read don't ask me why I read this fucking guy's book, but uh, Mark Levin's, um, I mentioned this before, he wrote a book about the amendments or called the Liberty Amendment, some shit that he wants to have a constitutional convention and this is what he wants to do. And um, one of the the things that, now I totally forget what I was going to say, um, that he wanted to do um fuck now i totally forgot what i was gonna say my mind just went blank on live radio um but it had something to do with that and oh i'm sorry that he said it was on you know he brought up the fact how it's unconstitutional for congress to uh give these agencies basically the right to make laws and and there were, there was a bill that, and that I read. It was a short bill. It was a it was called like a, the rulemaking bill, where Congress essentially gave the power to government agencies to essentially make laws. Like the DEA can fucking make a drug uh, between them and the FDA. They can make drugs illegal. They don't have to yep. go through Congress. Yep. Um. You know things like that that these agencies can make laws. And his point. And I agree with him, even though I, you know, don't believe in the Constitution because it doesn't give enough freedom. But that that is unconstitutional. If only Congress can make laws, how can you give, you know, and, and they made a law. But how can they make a law to give permission to an agency to essentially make laws? And that's kind of what they've done. Um, yeah. Well, that's why. The Constitution has become just a piece of paper, and because well, it always people, was a piece of paper. Well, but. the problem is, is that most people today don't even know what's in it. So, how can you really stand up for something that you don't even know what's in it? You, ass- you people, people have a, tra- you know, it, it's like with it's like with welfare. Um, well, that's people- been around for a while. That I, I don't remember what year, but that rulemaking bill um has been around for a while where they allowed you know they actually passed a bill that allowed agencies to you know make they didn't call it making laws they called it like making that's why it was called a rulemaking bill making rules you know so it sounds better but they're making laws right so um it, just another thing i wanted to mention on taxes real quick um before we finish up with this i mean People don't understand that it will never stop. Well, let, let me give you a little little thing. This is from USA Today back in October of 2014. You know how how the the government agencies, one of the reasons why they can continuously do this and why regulations have, have skyrocketed versus laws? Let me read this to you. 
This is a special report. The United States is in a perpetual state of national emergency. 30 separate emergencies, in fact. An emergency declared by President Jimmy Carter on the 10th day of the Iranian hostage crisis, 1979, remains in effect almost 35 years later. Post-9-11 state of emergency declared by George Bush, renewed six times by Obama, forms the legal basis for the war. A national emergency, if you know some of the executive orders that have been passed, that gives the president and the executive branch the power to become an autocrat. Woodrow Wilson passed the National Emergency or the Emergency War Powers Act in 1917 or 1918, giving him, not Congress, full control over the communications, the transportation, the monetary base, the whole thing of the and the people of the United States. Yeah, this you can view, isn't public. You can view this, you can yeah. view uh, a, a bunch of executive orders that all have to do with. Um, the it, not even the fact if you're saying that you know there's still an emergency that under emergency they can do all this stuff that they they being uh, um it wasn't one president it was you know a whole bunch of presidents but if you look through them um because they, they put them together somewhere but anyway it was a bunch of things that executive orders that presidents had passed that gave them the power to basically take over every anything and everything in a state of emergency. And now you know how but, Obama. But that's not how, now that's, you know how Obama broke the Constitution by by legislating with executive orders because. Well, it's just a. Congress, they, why did Congress not ever say anything about? I don't believe that's why they didn't say anything because it was it. under a national emergency. And if well, they had I, public, I, I, had they gone public and said, "Hey." You can't do this," he would have said. "We're under national emergency," and all of a sudden, the people would have said, "Uh, uh, I, I, dead. I, I don't know that 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 Congress even knows that, or or the president that it's. I think they're going to do what they're going to do, regardless. They don't need to, because they can they can get away with it. It doesn't matter. They can declare in a fucking emergency anyway, so it doesn't matter. It, it, if they're using a state of emergency from whenever they can declare an emergency right now and say, well, we're in a state of emergency because of terrorism. I mean, hold on, it, hold on it, it doesn't let, matter. Let me finish. Let me finish the rest of this article. Go ahead. In, in, uh, since 1976, when Congress passed the national emergencies act, presidents have declared at least 53 states of emergency, not counting disaster declarations for events such as her, uh, tornadoes and floods. Um, even as Congress has delegated emergency powers to the president, it has provided almost no oversight. The 76 law requires each House of Congress to meet within six months of an emergency to vote it up or down. That's never happened. Congress could intervene. They have chosen not to. Because they, it's, because it's all one big cabal. There's no. Like, well, that's what I was going to say. Democrat. Basically, all the, it's I was going to use those words, but yeah, it's it's all together. They're all, even though you know whatever they fight and have disagreements or whatever, but they not in publicly they try to you know show all this bullshit. But I'm sure privately they do as well. But it, yeah, I mean it's all government is a, a corporation and it's a, one group and it's not you know these groups are separate and there's checks and balances. It's all together. Now I um, know I know you're not a big fan of Donald Trump and and we'll put that aside for a thing. But but think about this. But I look at him ob- objectively to be honest. Right. I, I mean I, I, I because I don't I'm not a Democrat or a Republican. I don't believe in government. So I look at these people objectively as far as. Um, these type of things if you were going to bring up the i I don't go ahead because i don't know what you were going to bring up no my point is is if the entire establishment the media his own political party the cia with these fake reports the whole nine years if everybody's going after a trump even if we don't like his policies his politics whatever what screams out is oh my god the cartel the establishment is scared to death of this guy and if that's you know, for me, Trump is this. I'm I'm here nor there because I haven't seen his policies. I've just heard his rhetoric. 
But to me, I'm saying the enemy of my enemy is my friend. Well, I mean, the thing about Donald Trump that we should remember is that this is not a guy who we have just heard of that ran for president. Trump has been around since at least the 80s that I can remember, and that's only because, you know, maybe people knew who he was even before that. The guy has been around. He's he's shown and said a lot of fucking things way before he became president. And no one's really looking at uh, a lot of that stuff. And, you know, part of this could just be a, you know... Uh, a, another fucking scheme to well, show it, that it, like well said, look trump I, is I, the I, enemy because we know nothing's gonna happen they're not gonna throw him out of office they're well, not gonna no. they, you they, know, tried, they, tr- they tried to do these recounts the, the fake recounts. yeah they, but there nothing I, was gonna happen from they that. tried right nothing's gonna happen but they did it these are unprecedented i know but what i'm saying is they might like but here's the thing did you i know you were working today but did you happen to see what happened the news about his press conference no but i know there was some bullshit story about the going into uh, a room of where obama stayed and all that bullshit that prostitutes the are pretty, and, yeah it is just bullshit showers on the thing right right, right. What ended up happening was, I don't know if you know the whole story, back before the, during the Republican primaries, uh, John McCain hired uh, a former MI6 intelligence officer to see if he could dig up dirt on, on Trump. Well, this intelligence officer came back with some stuff from McCain, but it was completely unverified. Absolutely, completely bogus. Nobody would pass it, whatever. McCain took it to the FBI and kept putting pressure on the FBI to, to investigate and release it. And the well, FBI yeah, I, I know he gave some documents to the right. FBI. Well, that news made it to 4chan. You know, 4chan with uh, uh, where yeah, a lot of... Yeah, I, I heard that Fortune published that. Uh, I didn't know that's where it came from. Yeah, 4chan published it. And, and then CNN they got of, uh, talked about it too, right? Right. They got a hold of a of a, a media pundit by the name of Rick Wilson, and they sent it to him. And Rick Wilson ate it up like clotted cream. He thought it was real, so he took it to BuzzFeed, and BuzzFeed, boom, didn't vet it, and they yeah, just nobody. It as a, uh, and then, out of all the mainstream media, CNN took that BuzzFeed yep. thing and put it up there. Well, today at the press conference, the White House correspondent for CNN was trying to get in a question. And Trump looks at him and he's like, no, 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 quiet, quiet. I, no, I'm taking question from here. You're being rude. He says, you are fake news. I'm not answering your questions. Shut up. And <laughs> and, he, and it was just like, you know, the Trump being the boss, you know, like a, a, The Apprentice. You're right. fired but type think thing. about the, it, And it just shut down and he got applause. And, yeah, but think about that. You know, he has a dictator type of attitude. Now, I definitely think it's bullshit because I'm, I'm looking at that part objectively. I think the Russian shit is bullshit. I think this is total bullshit. So, no, I agree with you there. But... Um, he, he, here's the thing. Here's the reason why Trump is so popular. And like I said, I don't know if Trump is going to screw up the country. I'll tell you right this, in my pr- opinion, the economy is going to crash, and the banking system is going to crash, and he's going to have to see if he has the 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 cojones to do what's needed to be done to you know let the banks fail, let the economy go to the toilet, and then rebuild it with sound money from the ground up. I don't know if he's going to do that. But that aside, the thing about it is, is Donald Trump has been the only non-politician politician politician who has been saying the non-politically correct things that most people have been afraid to because they would be called a racist and they didn't have the power or the will to stand up to the, to this, you know, but this is did. this is a guy. If I if you look at his history before he ran for president, that held vendettas against people. One, he's a pompous ass. He's an arrogant fuck. Well, sure. 
Uh, but he went after people. He has this attitude like he's all powerful. He's the man. He's, he, you know, Boy. don't you can't fuck with him. And that's where I would worry about him. Because well, he would egoist. he would be somebody who would go after whistleblowers. He would be somebody who would nope. go after people that write about him. He would go after you know what I mean. And here, I, I understand thing. being you know. Uh, He's an egoist. He's an egoist. You know what the difference between an egoist, which he is, and a narcissist, which Obama is. You know what the difference is. One really big psychological thing: Trump loves himself, and he wants others to love him. A narcissist like Obama hates himself, and he needs others to love him to fill that void. And this is why, when it comes to lashing out... I don't know that Trump needs others to uh, no, he love wants him. Other, he doesn't need. He wants others to love I, him. I don't, okay. I, well, he, he wants others to think that he's great. Uh, but, well, sure, he's an but, egoist. He, I, I don't, I, I don't know if I, anybody, if, if look, I, I'll, t I'll tell you something honestly. Anybody who strives for greatness walks that fine line, and more, more often than not, they're on the wrong side of it. They have to walk the fine line of supreme confidence or supreme arrogance. I don't care who it is. Every single person who there's has been a very, very big difference between confidence and arrogance. There, but there's a fine line of walking both. Okay, Steve Jobs. Steve Jobs was an arrogant There's ass. No, I don't see any confidence coming from Donald Trump. I all, all I see ego, I see arrogance, and I see I mean, he he threatened to sue Bill Maher over fucking calling uh saying he he was related to apes and it was a total joke. He said produce a birth certificate um I bet you whatever amount of money or something. But it it, it was said as a joke. He produced his birth certificate like a moron, and he th he was going to sue him. I mean, this guy has gone after so many people for just talking shit about him and well, threatened yeah, but, to sue them. And it was it wasn't like false shit. It was just talking shit like either a joke or he's an ass or whatever. You know, he holds grudges against people. He, I mean. That's what I'm saying. There's a whole bunch of shit You're right. in but Trump's when it past when it comes, that you can when it look to, at. When it comes to arresting journalists and whistleblowers, who has a track record of doing that? Well, Obama, Obama. did it. Yeah. He, well, I'm not comparing him to Obama. I'm just yeah. looking at Donald Trump for who he is. Now, right. o Obama obviously has shown who he is. And, you know, they they mentioned that he may uh, commute uh, Chelsea Manning's sentence, uh, which is I, it, they, see, they should that's, pardon that's, him. Me, as, yeah, but, but me, that's, that's the whole thing is fake news. It, 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 it probably is. Um, if, and if anything, he's going to pardon Hillary. He's going to pardon most likely uh, the attorney general, Eric Holder. He's going to pardon all these people. Well, they crimes in office uh, to protect. Yeah. Uh, well, they well, they. My, my point my point is, I know we're, we got uh, some economic stuff to talk about, but my point is, is that in the whole scope of things, okay, I look at Donald Trump in this way. He, the enemy of my enemy is my friend. If the entire establishment is willing to fall to the levels of fake news, and you remember the, uh, during the election pulling out that whole string of women, every time a new WikiLeaks thing was dumped out, pulling a whole string of women going back 30, 40 years saying that uh, – Trump groped her or some other crap over and over and over and over and, you know, running with it. That tells me when, when there's, when there's smoke there or not that when there's smoke, there's fire, but uh, when there's, uh, you know, when you go to extremes to try to destroy somebody, then you have hit the mark and are ruffling feathers and scaring people in the establishment to extreme ends. And that, to me, is what I want to see. I don't care. What, I don't care about Trump. I'm not going to hold him in any any high pedestal. But I want to see if he's going to really drain the swamp. Are we going to cut I... these regulations? All these regulations that you and I just talked about a few minutes ago. Are we going to cut all that stuff that Obama and w the agencies passed? Are they going to take education away from the federal government and throw it back to the states and let people have a choice of what to do? I, I, That's I don't not see his him, agenda. I, I, uh, it doesn't matter. I mean, people say you're – and you're the one who said, well, people say whatever. So in my opinion, as far as when it comes to freedom um, – 
nothing's going to change. Now, he might do some stuff that some people like, whatever. And my enemy is the government. So if you're the fucking president, unless you're there to fucking get rid of as many laws as possible, then you're a fucking enemy uh, of mine. So either way, um, plus I, I could never stand him anyway. But at the same time, um, just because I can't stand him and I don't believe his bullshit and I think he's, you know, uh, that he really secretly is part of the whole fucking thing. Yeah, um, there's but a, there's but, a, but wait, let, let, let me let me finish. But I, I, I can, you know, I definitely look at it objectively that these stories are bullshit and that the whole Russian thing is bullshit. So I definitely think that. But whether this is a, you know, it could be a whole staged thing to make him look like, hey, he's the, I, who knows. Um, but what I want to do is, because we're running out of time, I want to take a, a quick break um, just because I mean, we've been on like an hour and a half now. And then when we come back, I'll let you uh, take it from there and just go through a summary of uh, what's going on. And because um, I know there's there's other other things going on with gold and Russia and the uh, a bunch of things. So uh, we'll talk about that when we get back. Nonpartisan liberty for all dot com. Oh, that's not what I wanted to play. To whom does your life belong? Who owns you? Most people instinctively answer, I own myself. But most people don't actually believe that. What does it mean to own something? It means that you and you alone have the right to decide what is done with that thing. What is yours you can use, you can trade, you can give away, you can destroy. So what does it mean to say you own yourself? It means that you and you alone have the right to decide what is done with your body and your mind, with your time and your energy. If someone else had the right to decide what is done with your body and your mind, your time and your energy, then he would be your owner and you would be his slave. So, are you anyone's slave? Do you pay taxes? Do you feel obligated to obey whatever the politicians decide to call law? Do you imagine that someone else has the right to control you, to rule you? Do you vote? In every political election, you are asked to decide who you want owning you, but owning yourself is never one of the options offered. The only choice you are given is the choice of which politicians will coerce and control you by way of so-called regulation and legislation, and confiscate what you produce by way of taxation. Whoever wins, you will be extorted and dominated. When you vote, whether you win or not, you are accepting that someone else has the right to rule you. You are conceding the state's authority over you. You are agreeing that you are going to be someone's slave, with the only question being which political master will own you. If you believe that you have an obligation to pay taxes, If you concede that it is up to someone else to decide how much of your earnings they will let you keep, then you are their slave. If you own yourself, you don't need the permission of anyone, any individual, any group, any collective, any country, any legislature, to run your own life, make your own choices, and keep the fruits of your own labor. As long as the politicians see you voting, petitioning, protesting, and campaigning, begging for tax cuts, whining for different legislation, as long as they see you timidly obeying whatever commands they issue while begging them to change their so-called laws, then they know that they own you in mind and body. Writing or calling your congressman merely tells him that you still think he's important, that you still view him and his fellow parasites as authority, and that you still think it's his choice whether to let you be free or not. As long as you play their games and legitimize their system, obeying their so-called laws and paying their so-called taxes, acting as if they are your rightful lords and masters, the tyrants know they have nothing to fear. The slave master doesn't mind his slaves pitifully begging for mercy, as long as they keep obeying and keep producing wealth for the master to steal. 
Those in power aren't worried about elections or petitions. What they do fear is that one day their victims will realize the truth, will stop believing in the divine right of politicians, will stop calling liars and crooks lawmakers, will stop calling the tyrants mercenaries law enforcers, will stop believing that anyone has the right to rule them, will stop imagining authority where there is none, will realize that they own themselves, and will stop bowing to the parasitical anti-human beast called government. If you own your time and effort, and the fruits of your labor, then stop asking nicely to be allowed to keep it. If you own yourself, then stop asking nicely for legislative permission to run your own life. If you actually believe in unalienable rights, in individual liberty, in freedom, then stop asking nicely for the sociopathic parasites to let you be free. For humanity to be free, people need to stop thinking, talking, and acting like slaves. Stop bowing to megalomaniacs. Stop paying tribute to sociopaths. Stop obeying political parasites. If you truly understand that you own yourself, then start acting like it. The United States houses more human beings in prisons than any other country in the world. This is true whether you're counting total numbers or in relation to population size. This wasn't always the case. The number of prisoners in the U.S. began to rise dramatically in the 1970s. So what changed in America compared to other countries? While there are several competing theories, a look at the data reveals that a significant part of the prison growth in the last 40 years has been driven by the war on drugs. Here's the data. By 1980, there were over 315,000 prisoners in state and federal facilities. 57% were violent offenders. 30% were property violators, such as thieves or those convicted of fraud. 5.5% of inmates were in for public order and other miscellaneous offenses. And the remaining 7.5% were nonviolent drug law violators. Ten years later, the drug war had grown, and the total American prison population had more than doubled to over 740,000 inmates. The proportion of offenders in each type of crime had also changed dramatically. The most growth occurred in the nonviolent drug offender population, which grew to a significant 24%. And this last statistic actually understates the influence of the drug war on prison populations. Many studies have shown that drug prohibition causes violent crime by leading to the formation of gangs and cartels. And thus it is safe to say that the number of violent criminals under prohibition is higher than it would otherwise be. From 1990 to 2000, the drug-driven population growth continued. By 2000, the total prison population had almost doubled again to over 1.3 million inmates. And by 2010, the prison population was up to 1.6 million people. The growth has started to settle and even decline in recent years, but the proportions of offenses are retaining their post-1990 levels. America's unique methods of enforcing drug prohibition seem to parallel its unique prison population. And one has to ask, is our country really better off with so many nonviolent drug offenders behind bars? Are drug users likely to be cured from addiction by being locked up? Has locking up dealers and users lessened the demand for drugs? Certainly, the effects on overall usage could not be called a success. And yet we spend billions every year on this war and lock up hundreds of thousands. Surely, there must be a less costly approach to addressing drug use in America. What's the mindset of these mammoth corporations who are now apparently in partnership with government? Eric Schmidt is Google's CEO. People are treating Google like their most trusted friend. Should they be? If you have something that you don't want anyone to know, maybe you shouldn't be doing it in the first place. Google has already been caught and fined for systematically hacking and harvesting passwords from millions of private Wi-Fi networks with its mapping cars. Remember 
and illegally siphoning private data from iPhone users. We don't need you to type at all, because we know where you are, with your permission. We know where you've been, with your permission. We can more or less guess what you're thinking about. So Schmidt simply views the invasion of privacy as a way to allow the internet giant to gain more information about you. And then that data will let the search engine help you in your everyday life. Don't you get it? Google is trying to amass a huge amount of personal information about you to help you. Duh. <laughs> there's, there's what I call the creepy line and the, the Google policy about a lot of these things is to get right up to the creepy line but not cross it. I would argue that implanting things in your brain is, a, is beyond the creepy line. Mine in particular. Uh, yes, yes. Um, at least for the moment, uh, until the technology gets better. Uh, let's talk a little bit about information and search. Wait a minute, what was that? I would argue that implanting things in your brain is, a, is beyond the creepy line. Mine in uh, At least for the moment, uh, until the technology gets better. Is he saying that Google's creepy line is defined only by the current level of technology? What does a higher level of technology have to do with morals or ethics? But what I learned in Silicon Valley was there is no moral component to technology unless humans insist that it be there. Are you looking for a podcast that talks about life, the universe? everything listen in to the illumination hour monday nights 10 p.m eastern 7 p.m pacific listen live at spreaker.com or nonpartisanlibertyforall.com we're also on soundcloud spreaker twitter tumblr youtube and itunes the illumination hour brought to you by nonpartisan liberty for all media and radio network and your host, Ellen Stallone. Because a spark can illuminate the world. Promoting the ideas of true freedom and liberty, nonpartisan liberty for all radio with Dave Bourne. Nonpartisan Liberty for All, and we are back. Check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. The uh, immediately after the show in our live stream, we're doing a Illumination Hour marathon. You actually just heard the commercial that Ellen uh, put together for the show. Uh, we are playing all 28 episodes just uh, live, well, yeah, live streaming them. They're not live, obviously. <laughs> They've already been recorded, but we're live streaming all 28 episodes. So ch you can check that out either at uh, on Spreaker or at uh, nonpartisanlibertyforall.com immediately following the show. So we're here with Ken Shorjan, who joins us every other Wednesday to talk about the economy and geopolitics. I know we've been talking a lot about other things kind of at the beginning of the show and and then got into uh, some tax issues. But I'm going to let Ken uh, take the uh, reins here and go through some of the important issues and developments in the past uh, couple weeks that have been going on since the last time he's been on the show. Yeah, since the last time, uh, let's see, Bitcoin. We had Bitcoin surge about uh, a week ago to near its all-time high that it had back in 2013. Uh, thanks to the Chinese using Bitcoin in a fashion that perhaps was not the intention of the, of the founders. Instead of using Bitcoin as something for commerce and, and, you know, tr trade transactions outside of the, uh, the purview of government control and all that, it's China, like their currency is going down, right? Is that yeah, to protect exactly. their currency or something? Well, not only that, uh, what it is, is China passed some capital controls, because as their economy starts to falter a little bit, um, they're trying to keep 
capital flight away, people from taking the yuan, their money out of China and into something else. Well, in, to do this, because the Chinese government's uh, cracking down on direct currency swaps, like say taking you know a, a Chinese billionaire taking billions of, of yuan and turning it into euros or turning it into dollars, they've had to find a medium exchange. So Bitcoin has become the medium of exchange between one currency and another, or you could almost say in, in layman's terms, Bitcoin is being used to launder yuan into dollars so how do they stop them from from doing that do they do they literally stop them from somehow like the banks won't allow it or like exactly that's what that's what once once they discovered and you know th this surge from bitcoin uh, uh, about three weeks went from 640 us dollars per bitcoin to 1145 but then all of a sudden, China came out and said, hey, wait a second, we're going to crack down and we're going to monitor every bank transaction, which they weren't doing before, for any real degree. Uh, Bitcoin fell from 1145 down to 900. And then China came out with some new ones that they're going to seek out and regulate every Bitcoin exchange within the Asian sphere, which included Hong Kong. And so it caused Bitcoin to which opened up this morning at 9.52 and closed at 7.50. But how did they stop them from uh, exchanging into dollars or into... Well, once uh, they bought the Bitcoin, they couldn't stop it. No, before that, like when they uh, tried, you know, the Chinese currency, yuan or whatever. And uh, the, bank, the banks are notifying the uh, central party, the, the communist party, the government. The oh, banks okay. are notifying them if they see any abnormal purchases. Right, right. Uh, a Bitcoin exchange, obviously, if you're going to do that, you have, you know, if you buy Bitcoin, unless you buy them from small amounts from some Joe Blow on the street, if you're looking to buy large amounts, you're always going to have to do that through an exchange. So this is going to be one of the interesting things, and it, 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 it's not something. I'm not saying this to dissuade people from Bitcoin, but what they have to understand is, is that Bitcoin is going to have extreme volatility for a while. And I think that's going to scare some people um, who, you know, maybe are buying into Bitcoin to try to get out of their own currency. You know, uh, they've got to be able to handle the volatility swings. Just a quick comment. I mean, the United States isn't all that different from fucking communist countries. You know, you think about checking bank transactions and all the fucking shit that the U.S. government has done, seizing bank accounts and structuring laws and all of that shit. I mean, it, it, it they put a, all the laws that they passed so-called in the name of terrorism with bank accounts, man. I mean, they're not that much different. Well, Even yeah, but Bitcoin, it, but, I mean, but, but hold on a second. Only a small little cabal who wants globalism and like the George Soros who want, you know, dominion over all of mankind. Those, those are set those aside. The vast majority of reasons why the government does these things is to protect, protect their current their fiat currency see everything changed after 1971 when we went off the gold standard the 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 oil crisis that occurred in 1973 was because all of a sudden because it wasn't backed by gold opec didn't want the dollar regardless of why they're doing it though what the, they're doing things that are you know totally violate people's freedoms and what i'm just making a point that you know, they're not that far off uh, a country that are communist or socialist or whatever. You know what but I mean? You got you to you separate, separate that out. And the reason I separate it, there's political communism. There's political fascism. Take out the politics of it. The economic methods are all based on the fact that every single country but three are run by a private central bank, which is controlled right. by... That. So those monetary policies are all going to be the same. Right, but I Depending, mean despite what the political thing is, okay? The 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 political communism, you know, United States is not communist. It's not socialist. Well, it's, it, a, it's it, fascist. It, look at the social the uh the communist manifesto and the planks. I mean, there's a lot of com socialism. What do you think? Government schools. What What do you think that is? That's That's not socialist. Uh, yeah, but, welfare. But it, I mean, but in, re in reality, 
pure communism would be no government. So you can't really. Well, say it's not pure. No, but I mean, there are elements of it. Right. And, and I don't but, want to get in a big discussion on this because I, I want you to be able to go through your stuff. But uh, my, my point is just that the amount of freedom in the U.S. It, it compared to countries that are looked at as not as free is it, it, there's not a big fucking difference, regardless no, dead, of the reason. You're dead on because there was a there was an international body that keeps track each year of uh, freedom and they include political. Yeah, the U.S. Social. keeps falling. Yeah, the U.S. is number 11. Yeah, so, I mean, it, it keeps falling f- right. further and further down. So yeah. it, that was my only point. But Yeah, go, and, uh, and the U.S. is already doing a form of capital controls, and they've been doing it since since the war on drugs when they started looking into anybody who uh, does transactions over $10,000. Right, or the structuring stuff. And, they started yeah. doing the structuring. And it, they've, uh, seized, they've seized civil people. Civil forfeiture. Right. Well, they seized now. I mean, it's gotten so bad. And I'll just say this real quick because, again, I, so you can um, get to your stuff. But, like, this is just one example, but this happens all the time. I, I had read an article. It was a family-owned business. It was like a supermarket or a small supermarket convenience store-like thing. And they just happened to deposit the cash every day. It was more of a cash business. And they, they seized, like, $30,000, didn't charge them with a crime, and then they got to get a lawyer to fight to get the money back. And it costs them, you know, almost as much money to get it back, uh, you know, than or at least half of it. it it's it, it's insane. But oh, yeah. Uh, go ahead. Yeah. There was somebody who lost one hundred and thirty four thousand one hundred and ten thousand dollars because he was doing that because he had a convenience store and his deposits were less than ten thousand. So, yeah, that that's that's, you know, and, and in part of that is once the civil forfeiture laws came in, uh, local Local governments during the great the Great Recession, who were suddenly losing money, found this is a great way to steal money from the people to fund their budgets. Oh yeah, yeah. The same with the police. Um, they, well, the police they, are part of the. Yeah, yeah. They, they get the percentage, you know, of the of the bust now, yep. like drug busts and stuff. So they they go after that. You know? See, in the in the past, the original civil forfeiture was if you if you captured the goods when an indictment was made after nine eleven. They snuck in a bill in Congress where you don't have to have the indictment. All you got to do is think that somebody might. Well, yeah, it's, that it's, opens it's every single person out because they can they can find microscopic traces right. of cocaine on just about every single every dollar, dollar bill. bill. Right, right. Mm-hmm. And 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 what it does is obviously you know it violates the Constitution, violates right. your freedom. It's but the it, whole purpose behind that is is the war on cash. They want everybody in the digital system so they can control your your spending, your savings, your whatever. Right, right. They know the system's failing. They want to bring in uh, negative interest rates, but they don't want people to do runs on banks. So they do these things to dissuade people. You know, it, it's like that old thing. If you want to if you want to uh, scare people, then you shoot a few people, but have thousands watch. You don't have to do it to all of them. Okay, there was an article I wrote uh, last half hour before the show started. This this just came out. The SWIFT system. It's the uh, breaking it's the, news. Breaking news. Da, 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 da. Uh, SWIFT is the Society for Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications. What it really is is the network platform that the world global reserve currency, the dollar, uses when other countries need to buy dollars to then go out and buy, do commerce and trade because the dollar's reserve and currency. And they got to pay a fee on it that goes to the U.S. government, right? Right. It's called, it's called currency swap. Now, they came out uh, and announced, they, didn't, uh, they reported this today, that SWIFT is actually in the process of creating a new platform, new financial platform, to uh, deal with cross-border payments, which is, you know, currency exchanges, on the blockchain. So forget Bitcoin using the blockchain. The dollar's going to start being on the blockchain. How, did, how is that going to fucking work? The blockchain Every tra- itself. I, I know how the blockchain works, but yeah. basically the blockchain is every tra- – right now for Bitcoin, what the blockchain is, every Bitcoin transaction is registered in the blockchain. So Bingo. you're you're saying that every bank transaction is going to be registered in a blockchain? Exactly. How the fuck are they going to do that though? 
they're using the technology of the blockchain and they're create think think about this okay think of your smartphone is that, as, but, but, as the blockchain wait, wait, wait. Is that, and people make apps for the block for the, your smartphone is that just that go through swift initially or is that going to be no you know when uh, you, you make london, any london has just made a gold uh new gold trading platform their gold market's going to go on the blockchain so, but as far, everything financialization they want to put on the blockchain. Well, I, I know they want to do it, but as far as the U.S., they haven't done it yet. Where you know you go and make a debit card transaction, that's not going to be on there yet. But they want no. that's what they're going for. Is what yeah, that'll take a few years. But okay, right but now, that has, right now, a, it's it's what exactly is right happening right now. So the Swift system. Anything that goes through Swift is going to be on the blockchain, right? That's what that's what they're they're announcing okay. that they're in the process of building. And what in in anything else as of yet, I, or is that the first thing? And no, twenty seventeen is going to see an explosion of financial platforms and and processes move to the blockchain. What information? I mean, will it have? Because I've never seen like you know I've never looked at it. But what uh, what information is on just so people have an idea is on the blockchain regarding a transaction like like that like with Swift or just period? Well, period. Um, say, well, well, say it's gonna... uh, say, say they went to never mind Swift or 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 even Bitcoin. Say they went to doing it for every transaction that happened at a bank, right? Say right. say Bank of America, say they did it by bank or something, whatever. Just for example, say Bank of America did it, right? So what would be on there information-wise? Uh, how much information? I mean, is the person, is it just the account number and the well, amount? Th think, about, and the, think, about, think about along the lines of if you have a Bitcoin account, what does that all have? Well, I, that, I, do, I don't know enough about Bitcoin okay. to it, I it, has, it has your name. It has the the special ID, secret password, code number. It has the amount of Bitcoin that you have. It keeps track of transactions that you do. So you know, think so about it's, it's going to have all that information yeah, on think, the blockchain. Think of the blockchain as this: the blockchain is a Windows operating system that doesn't have any applications added. That's the blockchain. Then some third party comes in, like uh, like uh, what's uh, not iTunes, but um, what's Apple's uh, uh, music channel thing? Real, real player. Say, say Apple creates real player, a third party thing, but it's compatible with your blockchain. Windows blockchain. So that's what that's what it is. Or like a smartphone, third party make apps for your smartphone. The smartphone is the blockchain. The apps are what control all the functionality in that specific. Well, thing. Are you saying the blockchain is like the database to the application? It, it's the it's the not the database because it doesn't store anything. Think of it as the network, and right. so you just have to write things that are compatible with that network, and it functions and flows and, and right, does right. that. Okay, so that's what's going on there. Now, there's an interesting thing that came up. Uh, um, with out of WikiLeaks that most people didn't really talk about. It's a communique shortly after Richard Nixon took us off the gold standard in 1971. It's a communique between the U.S. and uh, Britain to create a new um, commodities exchange for gold. It ended up being, of course, the COMEX and the LBMA. These are the paper trading platforms for futures contracts. This is what they said is the purpose behind these futures uh, markets. Uh, da -da -da, da -da -da, let me find this because I got to sneak through here. Um, uh, answer is yes to your question there. Okay. Uh, da -da -da -da. Okay. We will create the market with the expectation that large volume futures dealing would create a highly volatile market in turn, the volatile price movements would diminish the initial demand for physical gold holding. So what really they said in this communique is if we create these paper markets, um, we can use the markets to dissuade people from actually buying physical gold. Well, basically, pretty much what we kind of talked about and thought anyway, this is the proof that it was going on. Right. This is the proof that they created the futures paper market 
specifically to manipulate not only the gold price to protect the dollar because it was no longer on the gold uh, on the gold standard, but also to dissuade people from then buying a bunch of gold now that it was allowed to be purchased on the open markets. So this was in this was in the WikiLeaks, uh, you know, disseminations that came out recently that the media isn't going to talk about this. Um, oh, but it just fell not. under the radar, so I wrote a, I wrote an article over at the Daily Economist on that. Um, we have the interesting thing. Uh, think think about the old Prince song, because the uh, stock markets, the Dow, is trying to reach twenty thousand. Well, back on January sixth, which was what six days ago, Wednesday, you know, uh, Thursday, eight different times in that trading day, eight different times. The uh, the movement upward bounced off of the resistance at twenty thousand and fell backwards. It tried to break twenty thousand eight separate times. It was kind of like your uh, your YouTube uh, <laughs> subscriber there. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So guess what? The highest level it reached before it finally receded about a hundred points. Nineteen thousand nine hundred. I was going to say that, like the closest. Sixty three. Yeah. <laughs> that's as close as you can get without right, ever right. reaching it. So there is a good chance that that resistance level at 20,000 may be so great that we actually um, don't see it and we start having a maybe 5% decline. In the stock market? In the stock markets. And, you know, it's funny because that's – Obama in his uh, farewell speech, I don't know if you listened to it, uh, but he mentioned how, you know, the stock market, of course, and all the jobs he created yeah, um, and all that shit. But it, the stock market was one of the things that he mentioned and how great it's doing. And we all know that it's all rigged and fucking, you know, Fed money or whatever, or the money from the Fed to the banks to the stock market or whatever. Um, but... It, I don't know. It, it was a it was a bunch of bullshit, basically. Uh, the whole fucking speech. But yeah. well, to to give you an idea on just how leveraged the entire world is, and this doesn't even count derivatives. Okay. During the uh, first nine months of 2016, global debt, global debt, not just the United States, but global debt rose 11 trillion dollars, hitting an all all time new high of 217 trillion dollars. As a result, these debt levels are now 325% of the world's gross domestic product. To give you a little example of how big 325% of the world's total output is, at, at just barely a tick under $20 trillion of U.S. national debt, that is 106% of our GDP. Well, you had mentioned... Um the social security as well so it's it's really like 24 trillion or something right right but the the those those are those are held the government it's like the government's owing the debt to itself so i i set that aside there but we're talking about debt that's held by foreigners held by the federal reserve you know that type of thing things that uh the U, the us owes other people right, right. And other institutions 106 percent gd uh debt to gdp for the us but the global, we're talking Europe, China, the whole nine yards, is 325%. That means it would take three and a quarter years of taking every single dollar produced in the entire world to pay that debt. So when you say 100% with the U.S., that means their debt equals their GDP? Yeah, right now our, our, and you're GDP, saying the world our is GDP for last year – was seventeen or was eighteen point three trillion dollars? Okay, so and our debt is nineteen point nine eight. So you're dollars. saying the world's like triple, uh, th three. The the global GDP is approximately sixty two trillion dollars. Right, so it it's it's like triple what uh, the the debt is triple what the GDP is basically. Exactly, exactly. So, do you think the system's going to last forever? Not a chance. Uh, of course not. You can't. Uh, I don't know how. I mean, 
in because we've been talking about this for a while i mean for years and how they're able to to continue to prop this bullshit up i mean it's, it's called it's financial, every financialization. trick in the book i mean it's called financialization that means you keep all this printed money and all this extra money at the wall street level and not in the general economies and this is the reason why there's no jo new jobs created only part-time jobs why you know the gd the the gdp growth rate has you know, Obama went eight years, and he's the first president in history never to have a single year of his administration have at least a 3% growth rate. Because he's he's been in office the entire time the Fed has done QE and, and this monetization. Right. And, of course, you know, he brings up, we were, you know, in a deep depression, and I brought us back and all of this fucking shit and how his... um stimulus worked and it was just it, it, it well, was yeah. it's just a total bullshit speech of course um Rand paul is channeling his uh inner inner father and immediately it was the new congress has submitted a bill to audit, audit the, Fed. the Fed. They, they've had that bill for a while because i i, I viewed it a couple of years ago and they had so many signatures but that but that's not uh, see ron paul wanted to end the fed Right. Rand Paul just wants to audit it. Well, but see, the point is, is that you need to audit the Fed to find the evidence that then you can bring to Congress and kill the Fed. Okay. But uh, he's, he's even said that, though. Rand Paul has said he does not want to get rid of the Fed. He just wants to audit them and, and put them in check. Well, the the, Fed, the Federal Reserve, if they stuck to their their two mandates, would be fine. You know, let them be the lender of last resorts for the banks, not the taxpayer, not the depositors. Let let the Fed do that, and let the Fed deal with interest rates to to protect against inflation. If they did just those two things, then you know what, relatively fine, uh, because uh, it's. But the see, what, what's see, the, the difference is, though of having the Treasury just print the money, as far as it, for a lender of last resort? I mean, and and pay it back to themselves. Well, it wouldn't the, because, you know, these are private banks. The reason that the Federal Reserve, of course, gained traction was because of a bank panic in 1907, which was the first right. bank, yeah, bank panic since 1873. Because the, the banks, if left unchecked, will ruin the monetary system. And the whole point was that the Fed was supposed to stop that. And, of course... You know, they didn't. They didn't do any of the things like you said. They have their they, mandates, and they, they didn't meet did, any of them. They were fine until until the 1960s, when the following World War II, the military-industrial complex wanted to keep getting bigger by doing endless wars. We had we had a relatively well, balanced budget. Vietnam, we had I guess. we had we had a relatively balanced budget. We had a relatively low, you know, steady inflation, really low. Until about 1965, and then uh, they needed to expand the money supply, so they started doing that. And France said, "Screw this! We want gold for our dollars. We want don't want your dollars well, anymore." Leading to 1971, when they the closed Great the Depression discount window. happened under the Fed. No, well, yeah, but the Fed did not have the the power to monetize debt then. See, there's different things that have happened. The Fed did not put the money in. Most of the money that came in directly uh, that expanded under under FDR's programs were borrowed from the from the uh, the Treasury. The Fed didn't do anything at all during the Great Depression, and that's what Bernanke was pissed about. He said, "If the Fed had been involved and we had lowered interest rates and expanded the money supply, we would have not had the Great Depression as long as he did." Bullshit. Bullshit. No, the problem was with the Great Depression is that it wasn't one single thing. Okay, global trade had ceased to exist because of uh, all the, the the tariffs that had gone through. Plus the fact that in the 1920s and 1930s, Europe was in a complete depression. Japan wasn't trading; they were getting ready for imperialistic powers, and there just was no trade. And so. You know, you had the rise of electricity in the Industrial Revolution, and by the time 1929, right. 1930 came, everybody had bought these durable goods like refrigerators and that, and they lasted for 10, 20 years, 
So nobody was buying any goods, and everything just came to all. There was many reasons for the Great Depression, but the Fed, for the most part, was not one of them. The only thing the Fed did that really caused the Great Depression was they allowed an expansion of money to allow for margin trading in the stock market to create the bubble. But they learned they got spanked for doing that. That's why Glass Steagall came in and all these other things. And the Fed really didn't do much during the 1930s. But that being aside, we need to audit the Fed because the Fed has been not just dealing with um, monetizing here in the States, but during the 2008 financial crisis, they loaned money, dollars to Europe and they bailed out European banks. That's a no no. That should put them all in jail. And then, you know, go from there. But they got to get evidence to do it. Don't they give money to the World Bank or does that come from the United States government directly? Because, that goes from the government, actually. Okay. The IMF and, and the World Bank are because, paid by the, by the government. Yeah, because from what I understand, the U.S. is the one who gives the most amount of money to those, to both of those, that they pretty much control them. Okay, uh, let's see. Um, Mexico. Mexico may be on on the verge of a complete revolution. Mexico decided that they have nationalized prices, done price controls for decades. They have. I didn't even know that they they did that. So they're. For, what, for what are they doing like it in? Okay. Is things it, like gasoline. That. Like they don't do it for. Um you know, regular everyday goods or whatever. No. So what else besides gas did they, you know, like? Not really sure, but, but gas were the, were, was the big one. Uh, and, and they had, they had subsidized gas because they nationalized their oil company, Paymax. But gas, both in, you know, gas that you put in your car and gas that heats your house and, right. you know, all well, of. Uh, petro petroleum products, but primarily gas. Okay. What they did was they decided that uh, because they've been declining in their production of oil, um, they were the government was losing money by subsidizing these prices. So they decided to start raising the prices a little bit to then eventually let the market determine the price. Well, after decades of people being under this reliance, all of a sudden, the people blew up. And in a short amount of time, with a 20% rise in the gas price, there have so, been 400 arrests, 250 looted stores and six deaths, roads are blockaded, borders closed, the government buildings are being sacked, and protests have Jesus. sparked in every single province in Mexico. What's the, well, uh, just a couple questions, just because I think this is an important story, but so are you saying that they, as far as the oil that is sold to the gas stations that the the oil that Mexico produces that the government is saying is setting the price per barrel. No, 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 no. We're talking refined products from that oil. Refined products like gasoline, kerosene, heating oil, things like that. They, they so after it goes through, because other companies, I would assume, uh, do all that, right? No. they no. Uh, or is that done by the government? The, the government has nationalized their entire petroleum okay. system. Okay. So, so they up, have, they control the refineries, they control, oh, they don't okay. control the gas stations, but they control the everything up to the that. Price. So basically right. everything up to the point where it gets to the gas station or however the process is of heating your house, everything up to that point the government's controlling is where you Right. Okay. Yeah. So they, they pretty much think of it they control the energy. Yeah. So so then from there basically their electric bill or well gas bill but i mean it, i don't know how they have it set up in mexico i mean their electricity could be running off uh a lot of things could be running off gas i, I don't know but so well, sure. so everything is going up um when they go and put gas in their cars or whatever and i'm do you know what would be like what's how much it has gone up uh 20 20 percent 20 percent they they do things by leaders you know the u.s is still the old yeah antiquated use of gallons now here, here's the thing here's the purpose raising the gas prices was not 
the 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 primary reason it became the straw that that broke the camel's back all of this started with uh, an event that occurred in in the uh, province of Guerrero down uh, in Acapulco where a few years ago 43 students from a from a college were kidnapped and nobody ever found them yeah, I heard about something dead. going on because Acapulco is where uh, what's his name Berwick has his and Angel and Acapulco Clark is. and and yeah and and I heard a bunch of things about them um, recently. I I don't recall the specifics, but um, that uh, some fucked up things were going on. Yeah, and here here's the here's the scoop behind that. This occurred in 2014 and has been the source of continuous anti-government protests ever since. Though the kidnappings remain officially unsolved, members of the Guerrero cartel, drug cartel have admitted to colluding with local police forces to silence the student activists. 20 police officers were arrested. Uh, the police chief was arrested, accused of offenses including organized crime kidnapping the students. The corruption apparently goes all the way to the top. As federal authorities say, the the mayor of Iguala there in Guerrero personally ordered the kidnappings. So you have this these kidnappings of gov- the corruption of government officials tied to the cartels that has never been dealt with. Uh, then you have the rising of the gasoline prices just pretty much snapped. And you have protests every single day in nearly every single province. And here's the primary reason. Mexico is primarily an agrarian thing and the gas gas prices going up they already are at bare bones cost to try to you know fund their crops and every single crop out there requires a ton of energy gasoline for their tractors for right, running for their all the, things. Ma- all the machines and, that they and use they to, can't yeah. afford to do this and that's why it's, it's i didn't even think ahead. of that uh you know that they uh, are a big uh, agricultural uh hey it's winter country. time it's winter time most of the produce that we get in the united states comes from mexico right. and from latin america uh, at this time of year like the uh those tomatoes what are they called roma roma tomatoes a lot of them come from there uh, oranges whatever um plus plus the fact that the mexican peso as at you know I think I mentioned this before. In the 1980s, there was the Mexican peso crisis when the dollar was over 100 on the index. Yeah, Mexican you peso did, got did, to 13. 13. You know what it is right now? When, is if there was a crisis. Than that? No, there was a crisis when it was 13 pesos to the dollar in the 1980s. Right now, it's at 25. That's what I'm saying. Lower. Well, higher More, means higher. lower. But yeah, it, exactly. So <laughs> it's twice it's as worth, bad as the one right. It's worth less. So. so they have massive inflation. They have well, plus health, they have you know all the drug cartel shit too to deal with. I mean, exactly, and the corruption in the government. And yeah, that it, it's and, all coming to a head. You could suddenly see uh, if revolution takes place. Think about you know the rush to the border that these you know the the Mexicans are going to do then. If their entire country it's, is on fire, why? Just real quick, because uh, we we only got a couple minutes. But I mean, why is Mexico really the way it is in your opinion? I mean, it doesn't that it's I know of. of it's because of NAFTA. Most of yeah, the but Ill- Mexico was Ill- fucked up before well, yeah, NAFTA well, too. But, I mean, but Mexico. Mexico was is, is really an interesting history, and we can go through that. You know, you know they call Cinco de Mayo uh, Independence Day, but they had five revolutions and five overthrows and five Independence Days in like a 150 year period. So, which one is it actually? Um, the the fact of the matter is is that Mexico was a colony by the by the Spanish. Spanish, yeah. Who ended up intermixing with the the native the, Indian tribes right. there, the Mayans, the Aztecs, the, the the remaining you know who was there, and it was always a place for in the New World where place you know during our Civil War France took it over, Napoleon the Third sent. Maximum I didn't know France ever had that. That wasn't for that long. I, would, no, I wouldn't no. think. That was the main revolution that they that they celebrate was overthrowing France and getting France, them out of yeah. there. Uh, but you know, you also have at the beginning of the of the the Spanish American War, the twentieth century. Oh, no, not the Spanish American War. Sorry, oh, the Mexican, Mer- Mexican the Mexican American War, right? With in the eighteen forty eight, yeah, eighteen forty eight, and uh, 
there was still there were still re uh, revolutions going on at the, at the beginning of the 20th century. Remember the story of Pancho Villa? Yeah. I, I don't. I know Pancho Villa. I don't remember the specifics of the story, but I remember Pancho Villa, yeah. and they made a movie well, about him and shit. Guess the the United States sent down uh, a colonel, um, down down in uh, at that time to get him out because he was raiding border towns in the United States, and the United States sent down a a, a captain or a colonel at the time by the name of George, uh, George S. Patton. Patton was involved in stopping Pancho Villa from the Raiders, and of course he George C. Scott. Yeah, that's what what I think of when uh, Patton. Now here here's the interesting thing about all this. Uh, he just played him quick, in the movie Patton. Just so people. On a quick know. side note, the uh, Pancho Villa. You remember the song that sort of uh, is sort of a cult classic from Mexico, La Cucaracha. Yeah. La Cucaracha was actually created by members of Pancho Villa's gang. Because Pancho Villa had a green-colored automobile that they said looked like a cockroach. That's what uh, so they, somebody they said about my car. car. And I don't think it looks like a cockroach, but this girl at my old job used to say that. I have a, a clips. Uh, finally, the last thing I'll talk about real quick is uh, a black professor from Georgetown University is hoping to cash in on the guilt of white Americans by calling for them to create individual reparation accounts iras where the money would go directly to black people black causes black agencies and black infrastructures yeah uh, okay um i don't even know what to say about that what is a black infrastructure i mean that's just and it you know i think that reparations we can ask the community were, were organizer due. I, I've said this before. I think reparations. First of all, people forget that, in, in different people say different percentages, but they're all under ten percent. So let's even say, let's even inflate it. We'll say ten percent. Um, but I've heard eight and six of of, of people that were slave owners. Uh, first of all. The percentage of slave owners. Oh, but, probably. I mean, slavery was a horrible thing. And if you would have said after slavery ended that reparations were due, I think that the 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 people that uh, their so, their so called owners, their fucking uh, you know villas and all their property should have been seized and sold off, and fucking the money given to the uh, the. The former slaves. I think at that point, yeah. I mean, people got reparations for the Japanese uh, in, internment camps, but they were still alive. You can't go back from something that happened 200 years ago and say we need money and try to figure out who. Because, again, you know, not every black person was a slave and not every, you know, nobody alive now was responsible for slavery or uh, was a slave. Not even nobody's great grandparents that are alive now, most likely. I guess maybe if somebody's 100 years old. Um, but even still, I mean, we're talking about uh, a you'd significant be, amount of time. You'd have, so you have to be 100, 150. Well, I'm saying great, or maybe great, great. Anyway, but, either way, um, you can't be responsible for what, you know, if you somehow were related to a slave owner. And being that, you know, between six to eight, really, percentage of people own slaves, most people are not descendants of slave owners in the first place. Right. So well, let, let me let me give you a little, little expose here. Okay. We're talking about... about you know, the history always talks about the African. But do, do, just to ask you real quick before you before you go yep. into that, and then we'll finish this up in, in in the show. But do you think that reparations were due at the time? Well, they did. They did. General Sherman gave uh, uh, an act. Um, uh, it was like Field Order sixty five or something that the slaves that were were freed. At the time when uh, the Union Army was going through the South, they gave it was Sherman Order Field Order sixty five, which gave forty acres and a mule. To I know there was the forty was acres and a mule, but I didn't. Uh, from what I understood, nobody got it. 
oh no, there were there were thousands who got it. Now eventually, well, there there was a lot more slaves than that didn't. Yeah, but eventually the uh, the the states got it back. But here's the, here's the the thing about it. Okay, think about this. Okay, the. I know there the was, Irish. Is, is there, that what you're going to talk about? Yeah, yeah, because I heard your uh, podcast. But go ahead. There, there, there are very few instances. I mean, there were pirates who did this, but this wasn't a government-sanctioned thing. But there were very few instances where a government actually went to Africa and just went hunting for and snagged a slave. Most of the time, nearly 99 percent of the time, the slaves were traded or sold by other black african tribes well yeah they, it, they i mean that's that's a well-known fact also people forget that the actual slave trade as far as bringing people over ended way before slavery ended right they ended that first yeah, because what, the, like because the, the 17 british, something the, the, the british stopped slavery and i think the 18th 1920s or 1830s which was still true but here, here's here's i'm going to give you an example of uh of slaves who came to america 100 years before the africans uh they came as slaves vast human cargo transported on tall british ships bound for the americas they were shipped by the hundreds of thousands Are you talking about the, men, the irish or actual yep, okay included men women and even the youngest of children whenever they rebelled or dis, even disobeyed an order they were punished in the harshest of ways slave owners would hang their human property by their hands and set their hands and feet on fire as a form of punishment. They were also burned alive and had their heads placed on pikes in the marketplace as a warning to other captives. The Irish slave trade began when 30,000 Irish prisoners were sold as slaves to the New World in 1625 by a proclamation of King James. Uh, over from, from 1641 to 1652, over 500,000 Irish were killed by the English and another 300,000 sold as slaves. Ireland's population fell from 1.5 million to 600,000 in a single decade, but it gets even better. At a certain point, when they sent them over to the West Indies, okay, and it was also at the time that the black African slaves were coming over, the British masters in those territories would take 12-year-old girls of Irish, Irish uh, families, and they would uh, mate them with black Africans to create a hybrid mulatto which would be a much stronger slave that is not i mean that was far worse what happened to the irish in the whole scope of things was far worse than the the black african trade you know why because an irish slave could be bought for five shillings five ounces of gold an african slave went for 50 ounces of i mean of silver uh, not gold, which meant that as your property, you took care, better care of your black African slaves than you did when you could just throw away an Irish white slave because they were only worth five ounces of silver. Well, from what I, uh, from what I understood, because listening to your other podcast that they were indentured servants. That's the term that political correctness and revisionary history wants to do. But this was pure and simple slavery. When uh, and when was was that? What time period are we talking about? Uh, between 1641 and the 17th century into the 18th century, the late 18th century. But this wasn't. This was in Europe. Are you, are no, you, you talking well, about, this, right? this is right. Europe, but they shipped them to the New World, not just to the. So to it, the start, it started in Europe, and then they in what England, and then they moved them. Right. The, okay. the, Brit the British invaded uh, Ireland, uh, a rebellion, whatever, killed a large portion of them, and then enslaved, starting first their slave, 300,000. Right, and they they're still the in control of, uh, well, uh, Northern what, Ireland. Northern Ireland, now. right. But, but yeah, but the slave trade in America was first for 100 years before the black African was the Irish and they were all over. They were in the Caribbean. They were in the Carolinas. They were in places with uh, where British had Well, control. there were plenty of Irish that were free as well because Boston, well, that was kind of later, I guess. Uh, when no, the, the Irish those came, came in the 1840s yeah, after later. this was done when the, the Irish potato famine. That's when they all came right, over. Right. 
But uh, a lot of them, the reason I said indentured servants is because a lot of them had to become indentured servants. They couldn't afford the passage over. Right. Well, that, that's what a lot. I mean, that's not just the indentured servant part, which is basically like a slave until for a certain term. But, right. But the, um, the difference between slave, but, slave and indentured servants is that the owner of the slave got to own all their offspring. An indentured servant worked for seven years right, right. and was free. Yeah, and, and what great. I was going to say is a lot of people uh, that couldn't afford to come did that. It, it's kind of, it, I mean, we have a similar thing kind of going on now with these, uh, the, the prostitutes, the girls that end up uh, in a way that they, uh, although they're being tricked into it where they're told, oh, you have a job and whatever, and then they end up uh, becoming uh, prostitutes and basically sex slaves, but that's a whole other issue. On, but, on, a, um, final, on a final note, uh, in 1998, the president of Uganda in Africa spoke before the United Nations and said that during colonial times, the Brit- the British and the the other the American colonies did not steal slaves. They were sold by black tribal tribes who had taken over other tribes. And even today, this was nineteen ninety eight, some black tribes are still selling slaves to the uh Islamic slave markets that still go on in Saudi Arabia, Yemen, Oman, and all that today. Islam still has a slave trade today. Where are people screaming about that? Which is, you know, I don't know how they, how people can own other people, because obviously you don't own anybody. But if you capture somebody, I guess, and keep them hostage. um, Either death or slavery. They have a choice. Well, in a sense, uh, in the United States, we're all uh, loose uh, slaves with a lot to roam, but that's a whole nother issue. But um, anything else you want to mention real quick or? No, I think good? we're good. Okay. Well, thanks as always. Uh, and of course, thanks for joining us for another year. Um, and Hopefully, uh, this, it doesn't sound like it. I mean, we've talked, uh, last year was a pretty gloomy, (laughs) some pretty negative and gloomy conversations. Um, hopefully this year will be better. Uh, but who knows? I guess we'll have to see. Uh, I, you know, like you said, I, I don't see any uh no we've got, we've got some interesting system. things the, yeah. the european union could break apart depending on who gets elected in certain countries like marine le pen in france the euro could fall as a currency china china's currency is a, is in serious flux and no matter what donald trump does there will be an economic crisis of some sort the the debt levels are just, just too, too great. high yeah. the leverages are just too great the yeah. you know Think about this. Well, the 325% for the world. I mean, that's just ridiculous. And you have $16, $16 trillion worth of bonds in Europe that are negative interest rates. That's just crazy. Um, so, well, thanks as always, Ken. And go check Ken out at thedailyeconomist.com. Also on YouTube, uh, search for The Daily Economist or Ken Shorjan. Or if you are listening to the archive of the show, uh, you can get all Ken's information there as well. So thanks again, Ken, and we'll see you in a couple weeks. See you then. All right. Well, thanks, everybody, for tuning in. As always, it's much uh, appreciated. Uh, Coming up as uh, we stream live now is the... Illumination Hour uh, marathon, basically, all 28 episodes. And that will be running for a couple days because obviously it is, I think it's uh, probably 28 hours of shows. So uh, depending on when you tune in, uh, you'll be able to listen to whatever uh, show. It's just going to go through and uh, loop those shows. So, um, Like I said, thanks again, everybody, for tuning in. 
Much appreciated. And check us out at nonpartisanlibertyforall.com. Check out our social media pages and like us on Facebook, Twitter, all that shit. And have a good night. Goodbye, Brad. We will defend these police officers. Listen to police officers' commands, listen to what we tell you, and just stop. The nation-